Good morning and uh, welcome. Um, I am uh, Ana Albeniz from the University of Valladolid here in Spain and I will be chairing this uh, session of uh, the, our last day in the 25th UCOM conference. Perhaps we're a bit slow this morning after uh, yesterday's wonderful uh, evening, but no worries because we have a group of uh, great speakers this morning and also interesting talks and I'm sure they will keep us on our toes, right, all the time. Uh, just um, um, something to mention, uh, for especially for the people who are uh, in the other room, in the mirror room, um, there's a possibility for them to ask questions through the Q&A, um, so somebody will tell me, hopefully, if there are any questions and I can uh, um, translate or um, um, ask uh, the speaker for, uh, for them, right? So don't be shy and ask questions if, uh, if you have. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the plenary speaking this speaker this morning, um, Professor Pedro Perez from the University of uh, Huelva. Pedro studied chemistry at the University of Seville and all the BS, MS, and he also obtained his PhD there under the supervision of Professor Ernesto Carmona. Then, as a Fulbright scholar, he moved to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill to join the group of Professor uh, Brookhart. Um, and in 1993, he uh, came back to Spain at the University of Huelva, where he started a small research group uh, called Coordination and Organometallic Compounds Towards Homogeneous Catalysis. And uh, then he was promoted there uh, till the, his um, uh, current post as a full professor of inorganic chemistry. That small research group at the beginning uh, grew very much, and he has evolved to a very big uh, research uh, structure right now, which is the Sustainable Chemistry Research Center, SIXO, which he founded and he has served as uh, director for several terms. Pedro is uh, recognized as one of the leaders in the, um, the field of alkane uh, catalytic functionalization, including methane, and also the use of alternative reaction media such as uh, supercritical CO2. Uh, he has provided a number of uh, important developments in the CH functionalization of uh, raw materials, alkanes, as I mentioned, um, via carbon, nitrine, and oxo insertion in CH bond, into CH bonds. And in, for, in, because of that, he has uh, developed several novel catalytic reactions uh, all over the, over the time. Um, I have to mention that being one of the uh, leading organometallic chemists in Spain, he has also been very generous and have, has been very much involved in all the activities of the Spanish Royal Society of Chemistry. He has been a member of the board for some time, uh, serving as in the capacities uh, secretary uh, general and also president of the organometallic chemistry group. Of course, he has received uh, numerous uh, awards and recognitions. Uh, let me mention just yes, the Chemistry Europe uh, Fellow in 2020. He's a member of the Academia uh, Europea, uh, member of the National Academy of Science of Spain, uh, recipient of the highest recognition of the Spanish Royal Society of Chemistry, medal, um, and also he has uh, been recognized by the Royal Society of Chemistry with, the, for example, the Homogeneous Catalysis Award or the Corday Morgan Prize uh, in 12, uh, 2012. So, with further ado, Pedro, it's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ana Carmen, for uh, your kind introduction. Um, also, I want to thank uh, Marta. Thank you very much for putting together this impressive list of speakers and organizing uh, this event uh, so successfully. Also, of course, to the, to the organizing committee, the guys with the, with the green t-shirts, the scientific committees, it's been a, a, a great meeting and hopefully we'll, we'll always remember these days in Alcalá. And first of all, I would like to say that for a Spanish organometallic chemist, lecturing in Alcalá is something special. And it's something special related to something that uh, Ana has just said, that is uh, our uh, organometallic chemistry division of our Royal Spanish Chemical Society. Uh, probably uh, most of you don't know that this division, this uh, specialized group of a Royal Society was created, I mean, 
it is not, it, this is not important actually. This is a, these are the minutes of the first meeting of the organometallic division. And uh, in here, if we expand this, we see something that is that this was held in Alcalá de Henares on June 12, 1981. And that the first president, our first president, was Professor Pascual Rollo, that was actually the founder, one of the founders of, of this, of this uh, division. And we see some very historic, pioneering, pioneering uh, uh, researchers in the organometallic field in Spain. And I guess, uh, Felix, I think your name is over here, could be? Uh, I don't think so. You don't think so? Because you are one of the historics, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here we see Tomás Cuenca, for example. I mean, the, the, the pointer is not working properly, but, but uh, Tomás Cuenca is here. So it, there were like 40 guys, Luis Oro, Pascual La Huerta, well, I don't know what's their names uh, here, uh, Juan Fornies, uh, Pablo Spinet, and many, many others, Jose Jimeno. Difficult to me uh, to read, Carmen Claver. Okay, so many of them, but all of them were, were led by Professor Pascual Royo. So I, will, I would like to add this information to, to the very nice symposium yesterday held in on his memory. Okay, so as I said, as uh, Anna said, we're coming from the University of Huelva, from the Center of Research in the Sustainable Chemistry, and let me show you uh, what we are doing there. We are focused in the development of uh, sustainable routes, possible, as, as sustainable as possible, for a catalytic functionalization of either saturated or unsaturated hydrocarbons. And we like to work with uh, substrates that do not require much elaboration. So we like to work with alkanes, or we like to work with arenes, or olefins, or alkynes, right? Regarding the metal, we love group 11 metals, but we have also done some chemistry with other metals, shown here. And we surround our metals with uh, mono, B, and tridentate ligands, preferentially trispirazolilborate ligands, or trispirazolidamine, or uh, nitrogen heterocyclic carbon ligands, or these the amino phosphides. We have also developed catalytic system in different reaction media, like uh, obviously the, the conventional organic media, but also supercritical carbon dioxide, micellar uh, media, and also reactions in water. And today, I will show you some of the results regarding methane and alkane functionalization by carbene insertion. Also, a copper mass carbene as a transmetallic region for a, a stoichiometric carbene transmetallation. And then also we'll show something about methane and light alkane amination or amidation. So, regarding the first part, this is a general catalytic cycle in which uh, diazo compounds are employed as a source of a carbene, and with the appropriate metal center, it is possible to generate these transient metallocarbenes that can be used or, or that uh, show uh, reactivity towards the uh, transfer of this electrophilic carbene to a nucleophile in a transformation in which the nucleophile interacts not with the metal, but with the carbene carbon atom, and then the product is formed. This can be done with a number of uh, nucleophiles, and in the particular case of the CH bonds, we started to work in the area about, well, I would say, more than 20 years ago, and uh, our first uh, step in the area was uh, the development of this uh, trisparasolyl borate copper catalyst for a functionalization of uh, cyclohexane, or THF, but this is no, no challenging, the, the CH bond of uh, cyclohexane. And along the years, I see that, that I'm, I am losing some of the uh, less colored uh, figures. Okay. So I learned there, there is a, a big arrow here. There was in my hotel yesterday. Okay. And uh, so when we move, we started here, as I said, more than 20 years ago. Then we moved to less donating ligands, because remember the carbon is electrophile, so how do I increase electrophilicity? reducing the donation from the ancillary ligand. So if I place electron withdrawing groups onto the ligand, then the donation is lower, so the carbene is more electrophilic. So moving from here to this perbrominated ligand, we could reach now 
secondary sites of a linear alkanes with a, uh, with a body association energy I will show you in a minute. And moving from copper to silver, we could reach primary sites. And along the years, we developed different families until we reached methane, the ultimate uh, hydrocarbon, the ultimate alkane, using silver catalyst and this perfluorinated indazolyl borate ligand. And later on, we developed another ligand, mixing bromine and fluorine, and we could reach also methane with copper, right? So, working with methane, as you can imagine, is challenging. And it is not challenging because of the bond dissociation energy. Here we see bond dissociation energies of a series of CH bonds. These are alkane, cyclohexane, or here we have ethane, we have uh, propane. Uh, this is methane, it's 105 kilocalories per mole. So how do I work with methane? Because if I use any solvent with a CH bond, that will be here, any reaction that I, am, that I run with methane is going to be uh, competing with the other solvent. So this was the beginning of a change in my, in my lab, moving to a different reaction medium. If we need a reaction medium with no CH bonds, we thought, not actually, I didn't, I'll tell you in a minute how, how we reach it into this, this new uh, solvent, using supercritical carbon dioxide. If you submit CO2 above 73 bars or 31 degrees, then CO2 is a supercritical fluid that is, let's say, a solvent, right? I'll show you a video later on. The problem is that to work in supercritical CO2, you need to dissolve the catalyst, and uh, the best way to do that is to use fluorinated catalyst. And as I said, I would say that 15 years ago, I had no idea about supercritical fluids nor supercritical carbon dioxide, and it was when I met my good friend, Gregorio Asensio, that had a, a long uh, tradition working with uh, this uh, media in his lab at the University of Valencia, and we started a fruitful collaboration. Everything we have done with supercritical CO2 comes from this collaboration. He and his group taught us everything about this, and unfortunately, Gregorio passed away at the beginning of this year. So I want to dedicate this talk to him today. So, Run the reaction with the appropriate fluorinated uh, silver catalyst, methane, ethyl diazoacetate, and we were very happy to see that we could reach uh, the insertion of a carbon into methane, the first example of this reaction ever. This was a collaboration not only with Gregorio Asensio, but also with Michel Etienne at LCC Toulouse. And uh, it is important that, I don't know if this is going to be, okay. If you run a reaction, with any gas, but particularly methane, and the catalysts and the, and the reactants are in a, in a solvent, this is the, a two-phase system, hmm? this is when you run a, I don't know, hydrogenation, hydroformulation, whatever, you have a solution here, you have, you have a, the, the gas on top. Methane is, uh, the, the methane solubility in all these uh, solvents is very low. So in this case, our solubility is very low. When we have Well, this is a Star Wars. <laughs> it's a laser saber. Okay, so um, the only problem is that it, it is green. So for Sevilla supporters, we hate green, but anyway. Uh, it's, I, I do this because of you, just once. I'll use the green one. Ernesto would never use the green one. Okay, so if we have this pressure on top, this is more or less the, the solubility of methane in benzene or, or one of these hydrocarbons. When we have a supercritical mixture of methane and CO2, we have solution. And the solution is that the solution has, is one phase and we have more than, well, we have six molar, okay? So we have like 30 to 35 times more methane dissolve, that means we have more methane around the catalyst that is dissolved. So working with supercritical fluids helps us, help us to increase the concentration of methane and of course trigger the catalysis. Okay, 
This is obviously also a problem when we have to think how much of methane and CO2 use because the more here we see the solubility of a catalyst in terms of a ratio methane CO2. So when you increase the amount of CO2, then you have more catalyst dissolved, but then you have less uh, methane around. So we have to look for, for, for the appropriate conditions in which we have enough catalyst and enough uh, methane. Okay. So all right. So let me show you this video for those that uh, have never seen uh, supercritical CO2. So we this is a, a you know, pressure vessel. Uh, we have a all right. So here we are placing the diazo compound. Is the yellow thing? The, the the catalyst solid is also there. So this is open. And now we charge the oh, wait. Uh, as you can imagine, I, I don't know how to do this. But so this is one of the students doing this and. Uh, Everything is uh, computer control, and now we first pressurize with methane. Of course, nothing happens because all we have inside is a, is a gas. And then we uh, pump CO2 above the uh, supercritical condition. You see how we, oh, sir, can't believe this. Oh, we'll be back in a minute. So you see when CO2 Supercritical was uh, showing up, so shy. Okay, I won't teach it. So what I said that when we pump CO2 inside, you will see how some drops first form, and then the amount of, uh, let's say, fluid, you see some, some drops, more and more. This is accelerated, but it is just a two-minute experiment. You see, this is just pumping CO2 inside, and after two minutes, two, three minutes, we have an homogeneous solution. The whole reactor is full of uh, this mixture of CO2 and methane. The catalyst is dissolved and the diazo compound is dissolved. And in a GC directly connected to the, to the reactor, we see how this is done. So this is what we are going to use um, in many, when I say this is done in supercritical CO2, this is the, the experimental setup. Okay, so let, let's uh, see which is the mechanism of this transformation. So this is the reaction profile that was, was done by FLU Maceras. First, we have our catalyst precursor, dissociation of THF, and then interaction with the diazo compound. And now we have this transition state in which nitrogen is going to be steered, and we form the metallocarbene. Now the metallocarbene reacts with the, in this case, methane. You see the barrier, in this case, is about eight kilopounds per mole. So, um, we have this transition state, and from here, the reaction occurs in an irreversible manner, and we have finally the product, and we restart with, or we, we recover our catalyst. Okay, so if we take a look at this profile, we can detect three barriers here. This is the rate determining step, that is the formation of metallocarbon. This is very common when working with diazo compounds and transition metals. This is the, uh, the step where the selectivity is going to be decided. If I have two different CH bonds, here, depending on the, of the delta G, double dagger, will activate more or less of one or the other. And finally, as we can see here, this is like 60 kilocals per mole, so we are working and then under kinetic con uh, control. When we form the product, sorry, when we form the product, so we do not revert back, right? So, after we uh, activated methane, we found out that there was not any scale of uh, nucleophilicity of alkanes uh, using an organometallic electrophile. So all us work, Nobel Prize in the 70s, that was uh, this uh, chemist that uh, discovered all the chemistry we study in, in our uh, undergraduate program with super acid, protonating, alkanes, and so on. They have kind of studies with alkanes, including methane, but using super acids where we have uh, our proton as the electrophile. But with an organometallic electrophile, that is our metallocarbon, there was not any scale. So we decided to take a look at this, and we ran competition experiments between methane and 
different alkanes to evaluate the relative reactivity. This work was done by Andrea Olmos and Ricardo Gaba. So when we graph, for example, the reaction of propane and methane, we obtain a mixture of products, one from, uh, mm, uh, from methane, two from propane. These are some starting materials and, and byproducts. And we take a look at the profile. Now we have our carbene interacting with two different CH bonds, or three in the case of propane. This is methane, this is the other CH1. Methane is gonna have uh, the highest, uh, the highest uh, barrier, and then the other is gonna be here. So we can calculate the delta delta G double dagger, applying simple kinetics like this one. The difference is gonna be given by this one, and, and this ratio actually can be uh, connected to the relative reactivity, the, the, the difference, I mean, the, the distribution of products we measure. So, Andrea and, Andrea and Ricardo made this work with uh, 14 different um, alkanes, 29 different CH bonds, and of course they obtained a lot of numbers where we have the, rel the experimental relative reactivity, these are the logs to apply in the, in the previous equation, and the delta delta G. Of course, the best way to analyze this is to put it in this graphic form. And now, if you go back to your book, in the Arctic Graduate Program, you will see from this protonation of a CH1 of alkanes, I mean the electrophilic attack onto the uh, CH1 of the alkane, that the sequence is methane, primary, secondary, tertiary sites. And this is what we all learn, but this is, uh, as I said, when you protonate the CH1. But when we have these big electrophiles, this is the electrophile, this is now substituting the proton. As you can see, this is not true any longer. Of course, methane is the less reactive, it's here. But then, in red, primary sites, in blue, secondary sites, in green, tertiary sites. And as you can see, there is no a trend. There's no a trend because now what we have here is a big, big, big electrophile. So this was just a demonstration that it was not done before, that when we propose these trends in, in reactivity, electrophile, nucleophile with alkanes, I mean, let's not follow the protonation trends because it's not gonna be uh, uh, true. Okay, so once we have all this experimental data, we said, is, is it possible to connect the reactivity, the relative reactivity, with uh, some kind of uh, descriptors uh, of a CH1? And we face that, again, with uh, Feliu Maceras and, and Gregorio, and we developed this uh, quantitative descriptor-based alkane nucleophilicity model, the QDIN model. And this is a model in which we can obtain uh, a theoretical value of the relative reactivity of two CH bonds referred to methane using very simple descriptors. The type, I will show you in a minute, the type of a, of a carbon is gonna be primary, secondary, or tertiary. The size of the groups attached to the carbon of the CH1 we are studying, the number of methyl groups in the beta carbon to the CH1 we are studying, and then for very, very congested sites, we add a high static factors. And so, we only have, I mean, I can give you any, any uh, alkane, and this is very, very simple to uh, see directly from the molecule, right? So, I have to say that first of all, Feliu investigated uh, possible correlations of the reactivity with 60 descriptors that probably I only knew one or two. The other was this homo, homo plus one, lumo minus two, uh, things like that. And uh, it didn't work. So at the end, this was most uh, uh, logical uh, to, to, this, to the model. And here we have an example for it. This is 2 3 dimethylbutane These are the descriptors, for example, for the primary size, so for this bond. It's a primary site, this is one. Uh, the number of carbons, is, this is zero, zero, and this is uh, five. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, the number of methyl in the beta position is just one, this one. And this is not one of those special cases, so the descriptor for the for aesthetic is zero. And when we apply the model with the coefficients that are generated 
uh, statistically, we obtain 1.30 and the experimental is 1.28. This is the relative reactivity of that bond with respect to methane. So I will not, we did this with the whole thing, but the best way to see this again is to compare in this radial plot, in blue, the experimental values, in red, the calculated values. And as you can see, the matching was uh, quite good. Okay, so everything I have shown you is done with ethyl diazo acetate. What about other diazo compounds? Which is the effect of a diazo compound and their ancillary ligands? So these are uh, very recent results, and uh, we ask for you, why don't you study, or why don't you calculate the activation barrier of a CH bond of methane with different ligands and with different diazo compounds bearing donor receptor uh, or just donors, I'm sorry, acceptors, okay? So they have made this and this is, uh, these are again the figures and we see the three catalysts, these are one, two, three, the four different diazo compounds. We have also add rhodium tetracetate to the calculation because you know rhodium is a good catalyst for carbon transfer and we see very high barriers, but we also see these two in red barrierless. There is not a simple example in which the, the, the step in which a CH1 of methane is activated, is functionalized, is barrierless. To give you some information, when you have a, a for a, um, oxidative addition, the barrier of that step in which the methane is added is nearly 30 kilocalories per mole. So, well, this is better seen again here. These are the barriers. You see some barriers, 35, 30, but these two catalysts here with the trifluoromethyl diazo compound that it is named here D, there is no barrier. So this is predicted. Okay, let's go to the lab. And now we run the reaction. Again, this was done, or it's been done by Maria Angeles Fuentes and Jonathan Martinez. Jonathan is in the audience. And uh, actually, the use of this diazo compound for CH bond functionalization by carbon insertion with uh, uh, plain alkanes was only um, reported once by Fields uh, 59 years ago uh, and only described photochemically, not with a metal catalyst. And guess what? Fellu was right, and now we can activate methane and ethane yields 4258. Remember, we had this 29 with the other day as a compound, right? So it is true that we can go farther in yields with methane with this catalyst. And if we go and use propane and methane, now we have these two, 52, 65, but take a look at this. We have nearly 70 to 30 C1 and C2. And C1 is like one or two kilocalories per mole higher in bond dissociation energy than C2 for these guys. So. We were also interested in this, and now we run reactions, not only with butane, sorry, propane and butane, but also with pentane and hexane. So the whole series in which we have primary and secondary sites. And we use both, um, both diazo compound, the fluoromethyl and the ethyl diazo acetate. And the results are shocking. These are this is the, the, the percentage of a primary CH functionalization product, the C1 functionalization product with ethyl diazo acetate, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, and here we have the uh, trifluoromethyl. So there is like a 25 to 30% difference. The CFA group is not only more active, more reactive, the carbine, but also is more selective. And so why is more selective? Again, let's go to the ICIQ and Felius uh, lab, computer lab, and this is what they have found. This is with ethyl diazo acetate and propane as a model. We see here, for a primary sites, the barrier is 3.7, for the secondary is 2.7. There is one kilocal more per, uh, difference, and this is exactly what corresponds to what we observe experimentally. But guess what? With the trifluoromethyl diazo compound, there are no barriers. The FT studies indicate there are no barriers for the primary and for the secondary. So what Feluha and, and his group uh, have done 
is molecular dynamic calculations. And what we see here, I mean, they, they have, let's say, counted the number of molecules and the orientation of the molecules that are inside a sphere around of a radius of six angstroms. And they have calculated, they have estimated that there is a higher probability of interception of the primary sites in that sphere. The, 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 higher, the highest is in the peak or in the distance between 5 and 6.5, whereas for a secondary site, the sphere is 5 to 75, 7.5. So they are barrierless, but it is this orientation around the carbine that makes that the primary sites are preferred. Okay. So we've been working in this area of transferring carbines from uh, from uh, diazo compounds for uh, for uh, many years, and we have done many many uh, functionalizations to olefins, alkynes, amine, leucine, the alkanes, and so on. Certain point we said. Let's go and try to see a metallocarbon. Let, let, let's try to see this guy. And uh, Ana Pereira started this uh, during her thesis. First, first try was very simple. Uh, we take this catalyst and we add just the diazo compound, carbon 13 label. This is the ethyl diazo acetate, but even at minus 80, we only see coupling of, her, of the um, uh, carbine, right? So we don't see any carbine. And then she moved to a uh, donor receptor. In this case, this is the catalyst. This is the diazo. We mix it at minus 35, and we get this orange solution. And she managed to isolate crystals from there that were not, was not a carbene, a metal carbene, was this diazo, diazo adapt. Actually, we could have the, I don't know if you see that, but here we have a copper. And this is the nitrogen, nitrogen, and carbon, right? So. We know that the first step is coordination of a, of a diazo compound. I mean, no big deal, but it was nice to have it. But then if we, if she allowed to reach room temperature in the NMR, she observed loss of nitrogen and formation of a metallocarbene using different TP ligands. And so these are the resonances of this carbine, uh, carbon atom. We see there is a, difference in, in the uh, chemical shift. But what is interesting also from an um, inorganic organometallic point of view is that we found a very nice correlation in between this chemical shift and the new COs, the, the stretching, uh, the carbon the stretching bands in the IR uh, for the corresponding TP copper carbonyl. So this is a very nice correlation. So this is, uh, on the other hand, quite logical because if we take a look at this simple picture of the interaction in the um, donor acceptor of, a, of a orbitals, both the CO and the carbines are quite similar. Okay, so we saw carbines, but we saw the substituted carbines that were known, no big deal. We wanted to see a monosubstituted carbine. So, Maria Alvarez tried different things and, and uh, at the end of the day she tried this diazoceramide. I mean, there is another story to explain why she took this one, she, she picked this one, but I have no time for that. So, when she ran the reaction of this copper complex with this uh, labeled diazo compound, she observed a resonance in, in the carbon NMR at 236. Looks like a, a, a carbene. Very happy. Wow, eureka. And, uh, Actually, in the proton, we see the doublet because this is labeled, very nice. This is an heterocorrelation. Believe me, there is a mark here. This is the doublet, this is the carbon. Okay, very good. But we thought we have it, we have it, we have it. But when Maria started to see the, the, the NMR data, she said, there is no carbonyl resonance. Hmm? We need a carbonyl resonance anyway. There is no carbonyl resonance. I mean, what is the carbonyl? In the IR, there is no carbonyl. So, got it? Probably not. And she said, well, I'm going to prepare the doubly labeled dicarbonyl diazo compound. And you see here, thank you. Coffee will be prepared.
thank you very much for coming. I didn't say that you, you all are survivors of, of uh, <laughs> last night. Okay. Um, so you see these, these are two doublets, obviously, because of this coupling. And when she ran the reaction with this diazo compound, the carbene, this is the copper carbene complex, it was a singlet. So clearly, there is loss of the CO, uh, of this CO group. And she also managed to grow crystals, and the copper is here, CH and N with the two ethyl, there is no carbonyl there. So this is a carbene decarbonylation, and actually the distance of a carbon nitrogen bond is about 20, 128, I guess, yes, here, there is typical for a scene. So this is more like a Fisher, uh, classic Fisher carbene. So why is this important? Because for those working with diazo compounds, hmm, usually, uh, for example, bus, if we put a diazo compound, we expect that the carbon, the, the, the two substituents in the carbon, in, sorry, in the diazo compound, is going to be the same one in, that in the carbon. We, we expect that, we assume that. You never expect that this is going to be different from this one. That is what happened in our case. Here we have a CONA2, and here we only have the diethyl amine. So this was the first sample in which there is a transformation in which the, the, the carbon is modified, right? And this was a very stable compound. That's why we have the, the X-ray. Obviously, this is not electrophilic anymore. Hmm? Actually, it's nucleophilic. We could not transfer that, but we took advantage uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Ana Carmen Albeniz and Agustí Lledos in which this is the metallocarbene, the copper, meta the, the copper carbene, and we have found that we can transfer this carbene to other metal sources very nicely. For example, with the rhodium chlorocyclotadine, uh, we obtain this one. Same thing with others, CP star, rhodium dichloride, uh, palladium dichloride, uh, phosphine acetonitrile, or this even gold chloride THT. In all cases, we see, we, we nicely see in the NMR scale exchange, and we, we can detect the, the, both the proton and the carbon new resonances. Well, so it's, it's quite uh, interesting because we have the direct transmetallation of a monosubstituted carbenes that we all know from the organometallic point of view that are not easy to prepare, are not easy to uh, make them stable. So, here we see, in two cases, we have isolated. Again, this is the rhodium, uh, CH, nitrogen. C, this is palladium, CH, nitrogen. And, uh, well, we have a new ligand in the family. And how this ligand compare, how this carbene ligand compare with other known carbene ligands, for example, with the nitrogen heterocyclic carbene ligands. So let's go and use one of those probes that uh, the organometallic chemists know, know uh, or very often uh, use it, that is the preparation of this rhodium bicarbonyl and the evaluation of the uh, average new CO bands in the uh, IR gives you an idea of the nucleophilicity, the, the donation uh, or capabilities of this ligand here. Well, when we compare this with other values, this MAC ligand, this is the monosubstituted amino carbon ligand, we call it MAC, and uh, we see that the value is very close to cymes or to this IMES with two bromides. So we, are, we have, we have a, a rather small ligand, but with a nucleophilicity similar to those nitrogen heterocyclic carbon ligands that are big in size. Speaking about size, we use Luigi Cavallo's buried volume, we see here this is our product, this is our palladium carbene, and here we see comparison with uh, other similar, this is uh, Alois Hursner's, and, and here we have uh, two from uh, other, other authors, and we see that our ligand is quite reduced in volume. So what we have? We have a carbon ligand that donates similarly to nitrogen heterocyclic carbon ligand with bulky groups in the, in the wing tips, but with a reduced size. but it is stable. It is so stable that we've been able to prepare the first uh, carbon, monosubstituted carbon of this rhodium tetracetate. 
This is the universal, I would say, universal catalyst for carbon transfer. Many authors have uh, since the discovery by Noel Santesia in the 80s. All the rhodium, the rhodium chemistry transferring carbene comes from, from, from this uh, uh, skeleton. So we can isolate this, so we can uh, um, characterize this one. Uh, we see very well, you don't see, but this is a, a doublet, and this is a doublet of doublet coming from the, uh, this um, um, coupling with the two different rhodium. And if we take a look at the data, we compare with the only two other examples in the literature. This was reported by Hugh Davis, this is by Alois Fusner. You see they are desubstituted. There are no monosubstituted carbons of this, of this carbon. And this is, this is not uh, transferring the, the carbon anymore. There are similar compounds with nitrogen heterocyclic carbon ligands, a substituted and so on. No one with a monosubstitute. So how does transmetallation occur? So we have... Agustin Yedos calculation, probably the author most seated along the conference. <laughs> and uh, this is how the reaction occurs. Let's see if, if all the pictures can be seen. So we're going to go from this TP copper, carbene, and the palladium to TP copper, acetonatrial, and the carbene here. First step is that the TP moves from kappa 3 to kappa 2 and palladium and copper approach. Here we have a kappa 2. Uh, TP ligand, now we have this interaction between copper, palladium, and the carbene, and acetonatural is moving away. Now we have now this uh, bismetal uh, cyclo, whatever, uh, as a, an intermediate. Acetonatural is out, and we have a kappa 2 TP mesethyl. Guess what? Now we move from kappa 2 to kappa 1, so mono, monodentate TP ligand here. And uh, uh, acetonatrile now is approaching copper. We still have this three-member ring. And now we have a, a steel kappa-1, acetonatrile bonded to copper. I'm mixing intermediation and transition state, but trying to follow all the process. And here now we are moving from kappa-1 to kappa-3, acetonatrile bonded to copper. And now th this copper, palladium, and copper, carbon interactions are disappearing, finally leading to the product. So this is a, a it, it is this capability of a TP ligand to being kappa 3, kappa 2, kappa 1 that allows this transmetallation to be so favorable. Well, let's switch gear to nitrine transfer. We have also done many, many uh, nitrine transfer reaction along the years in, in my group using the same scaffold, TP, copper, and silver, through metallonitrines. These are uh, metallonitrines that are uh, triplet uh, nitrines. And we have transferred to a different substrate, alkanes, olefins, larines, dienes. We have also discovered new reactions uh, with furans or alkynes or amines or alines in which there are some other rearrangements after the nitrine is transferred. And one thing we wanted to do, imagine, or guess what? We wanted to transfer to methane, right? Just, I mean, we can activate methane with the, with the carbon, but we want to do that with nitrine because there is not a single example in which nitrine, nitrine in this manner, is transferred to methane. And so, there is one paper from Sukbok Chang, published a couple of years ago, in which uh, with the cobalt porphyrin and uh, this uh, azide, the truck, Aside, could functionalize the CH bonds of ethane and propane and butane, but not methane. So after this work, this is fun, because after this work was published, I had at that time three, three, uh, two postdocs in my lab, and, and Elena, that is in the audience, is following this work, uh, that came into my lab and said, have you seen this paper? Uh, yeah, well, yes. Uh, why don't we try that with methane? And if you take a look, we usually, let me go back, we usually this, use this uh, iminoyodonane as the nitrine source, never aside, because when we use tosyl aside, this is not working. Tosyl aside does not give our TP, copper, or silver nitrine. So they said, why don't we try this? And I said, yeah, it's not going to work. Our calories do not work with, uh, with the azides. We want to try. Can we try? Yeah, but you're, you're going to lose your time. 
obviously, as you can imagine, I was wrong. And they went to the lab and, and first tried cyclohexane. This is the trochoside with our, some of our catalysts. And as you can see, this TP bromocopper was a champion. It was possible to transfer for the first time with an azide and our catalyst the nitrine to uh, cyclohexane. And so then they start working with the corresponding light alkanes. And with butane, they insert the nitrine at 80 degrees into the primary or secondary sites. With propane, also a mixture of both products. Ethane was also functionalized. These yields are more or less similar to those reported by Chan, but the difference is done when they try methane, and not a big yield, but a concept. It is possible to transfer a nitrine, a nitrine group from anazide to the CH bond of uh, methane. Uh, this is the mechanism. Uh, it is a common expected mechanism, hydrogen uh, atom abstraction and then rebound, similar to, to what is known in literature for these transformations. Uh, aside forming the nitrine, triplet nitrine, abstraction of a hydrogen, this is in the cage, and then rebound and obtention of um, formation of a product, right? Um, but in any case, I want to point out that it is not working with tosyl aside. So, I mean, I was a bit right, not only, not full, but a bit right. Okay, but it's good that, that they manage uh, they, they followed uh, their, their, their feelings that uh, they should try this thing. And uh, yeah, let me finish with the last system I want to show you. That is the light alkane catalytic dehydrogenative amidation. So the previous one was the amination. Now we're going to talk about amidation. So this is a paper, this is a precedent from John Hardwick's lab in which he reported the use of a copper catalyst and uh, the terbutyl peroxide to form a carbon nitrogen bond and losing formally hydrogen. That is not nitrogen actually. So after we saw this report, one, one day we talked together and we said, why don't we try your system in our reactors and we try to see if it is possible to do something with gaseous alkanes. And he said, well, yeah, why not? Let's do it. And so the objective was to do the same thing, but with gaseous alkanes and if possible, ultimately the same. So this was done by Ricardo Gava and Maria Angeles Fuentes. And this is the first uh, array of reactions, ethane, uh, one amide, uh, the catalyst, that is one, we employed several copper catalysts in benzene and using the corresponding peroxide. And we see that the copper iodide phenantrolin was uh, the champion in this case, giving 40% of that, the first amination, amidation of ethane by this methodology. As uh, you see here, we have this product that is a methyl group. That the, this, this ethyl is coming from ethane. The methyl is coming from the decomposition of a tributyl group. That is important for something I will tell you in a minute. Okay, so scope. Um, here we have a thing, the same thing, same system, 120 degrees, and we see that the best one is that having these three, five, three fluoromethyl uh, groups in, in the MI, 94%. This is done in benzene. So what we are having here is, as I said before, we have a benzene, at the bottom of a reactor and the ethane pressure on top, two-phase catalytic system. We wanted to see if it was possible to do this on supercritical CO2, mixture of CO2 and ethane. And this is what we obtained. Obviously, now we cannot use this catalyst. This is not soluble in supercritical carbon dioxide. So we prepared different, or they prepared different fluorinated catalysts. Uh, the, here we have uh, BP, aphenantrolin with, a, with a this fluorinated chain, so on. And we see that with this fluorinated catalyst, this phenantrolin with these two ponytails here, we could reach 80%. It's not as good as that one, but this demonstrates that we can also do this transformation in supercritical carbon dioxide. 
Why? Because we wanted to work with methane. And with methane, we need that such big amount of methane dissolved. Because with the biphasic system, we have very tiny amount of methane dissolved. So, let's take a look at the mechanism. And then I will show you the, uh, uh, the methane thing. So this is how we explain the transformation based on previous uh, Hardwick's uh, um, work. We form this copper amido, and then with a molecule, a second molecule of, a, of the amide and the peroxide, the peroxide abstracts this hydrogen. Now we have this bismido and this radical. This radical is the one that abstracts a hydrogen from the alkane, methane, butane, propane, whatever. And then the radical that is formed here is going to intercept the copper and we have the product. But as I said, it is possible that under these uh, reaction conditions, this radical also decomposes, giving a methyl radical and a molecule of acetone. And this methyl also intercepts this and gives you the byproduct I showed you before. But if we work with methane, what is going to happen? That this R is going to be also a methyl. So if we just put methane there and run the experiment, we don't know if what we are detecting is that coming from here or that coming from there. So the solution to this problem was to use deuterated peroxide. If we put deuterium here, all the tributyl groups are deuterated. Here we are forming CD3 radical, and the radical that is coming from this abstraction is CH3. So if we uh, can detect the CH3 product, we are activating methane. That, by the way, as I said, had been never reported. And we did that, and we were very happy to see that in addition to the CD3, CD3 product, that is the major product, we observe also some uh, methane functionalization. Methane that is activated, as I said, by this radical. So this is also, this is the amidation of methane. So as you can see, we've been able to put on the table two ways to form carbon nitrogen bonds with methane. Now, the, the, the field is open to see if we can improve, we or others can improve those yields. I'm sure uh, someone will find a, a better way. So, with this, I want to thank the people that has made the work. I've, I've been giving the credit to all the people working in the lab, but also, um, uh, as, as important as, as, they, uh, as them, are the faculty members that uh, are accompanying me from the last 25 years in Huelva, and that uh, are also the co-directors of the very many different research projects that we have. Tar Maria del Mar Díaz, Angana Caballero, Jose Maria Muñoz, Tomás Rodríguez, y and Manuel uh, Romero Fructos. Tomás and, and Manuel have been here and are in, in the audience. People working in the lab, as I said, people who give money, and uh, again, I want to thank Marta, I want to thank uh, the, the organization for this excellent, outstanding uh, organization of this meeting. And of course, thank you to all of you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pedro. <coughs> so that we have time for some discussion. So are there any questions? Thank you, Bas, um, you're a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, uh, of course, it is, this Mac ligand is fascinating. It, it's, it's, it's not a big Mac, but a small Mac. Yeah, yeah. Really nice. <laughs> 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 but but uh, what I'm wondering is, um, uh, 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 what is the mechanism of this decarbonylation? Maybe, maybe you, you told it, but maybe uh, I missed it, but no, no, it's no. fascinating. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't mention that. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, we published this a couple of years ago, and I want, I want to focus today in the transfer. This is a, a quite interesting question because in the mechanism that was also uh, 
calculated by Feliu Maceras, when we have the first step is the formation of a, of a metallocarbon that you expect from, from the diazoceramide. Uh, that is, you form the, the carbon and you have the, the carbon, car, uh, the carbonyl, the nitrogen. But then that evolves to a ketamine. So you form this C double bond C double bond O in there, and then from there the, 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 there is a, um, uh, a shift of the nitrogen to the to the carbon of the carbon carbon and formation of a CCO, and that is the place where the the, the carbon is is, is uh, cleavage. So it's through a, a, a ketamine um, intermediate. Oh, great, interesting. Thank you. Um, Miguel, there's a question here. Very nice, Pedro. Um, I find your barrierless reaction quite outstanding. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you have our yields around 40%. With so methane, 42 or something, yeah. What is happening with the rest of the of the of the um, acyl compound? I mean, that's a very good question, and uh, it is. We ran. I didn't say that. Uh, we use hexafluorobenzene as the solvent, right? And because we, you, I mean, we, we try to avoid any CH bond. So you said, well, you know, hexafluorobenzene. Nothing is going to happen to hexafluorobenzene. No. The metal nitrine intermediate that we form is so reactive that transfer the nitrine to the hexafluorobenzene, uh, forming uh, an azuridine and then opening to a seven members uh, ring. So that is the, the byproduct, that is uh, solvent derived uh, product. But there is no way we can go further by now with the solvent. We have, we have tried different solvents. And this is the best buy now. And the thing is that uh, we cannot use, in this case, we don't know why, uh, we cannot use, well, we, we know why, we cannot use uh, supercritical carbon dioxide in this system because, of course, you have the SI. The SI with the CO2 has a history among them, and, and they don't allow to react. So when you put the SI and the carbon dioxide, there are secondary reactions that, that does, do not allow the, the nitrogen to be formed, right? So that, that's a problem. Because otherwise, if we could put that on, on a supercritical CO2, probably we would have like a 80 to 30 percent. Thank you. Any I other like questions? Small Mac. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't know if um, from the other room there's other questions. Um, <laughs> no? Okay. Anybody here? Okay, so if there are no questions, Pablo, uh, Pedro will be around uh, some uh, today, so uh, there will be a chance for you to ask. Let's thank again uh, pa uh, Pedro for this. Thank uh, you very much. Beautiful talk. <laughs> okay, so we move to our oral communications, and the first one will be uh, our first speaker, Eva Evia. Uh, she is a professor of inorganic chemistry at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Um, she is well known, of course, for, yeah. her, for her extensive work in polar organometallic chemistry. And today, she will be talking about synthesis, bonding, and uh, catalytic applications of homoleptic trilithium nickelates. <laughs> Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Good. So first of all, I, I would like to start by also thanking the organizers for a fantastic meeting and also for giving me this opportunity to share with you some highlights of our work uh, on zinc chemistry. And uh, this is Bern, of course you all know this now. And I would like to start also by thanking the main driver of this, ray of this chemistry in my group. This is Andrew Boris, that many of you probably already know. He's a fantastic postdoc, and he really took this chemistry into, into new levels in my group. So I am extremely grateful um, for his uh, support. So nickel. Of course, uh, nickel has emerged as a more sustainable alternative to palladium in, in many carbon-carbon bond forming uh, reactions, and perhaps the kumada curvio reaction is, is one of the most uh, classical examples. But nickel, nickel can do things that palladium can only dream about. And this is, for example, 
um, to activate aromatic ethers towards cross coupling. Yeah? And this reaction may sound or may look a bit exoteric for you or a bit exotic, but actually this is very um, helpful because um, this allows for later stage uh, functionalization in organic chemistry. And also, uh, these type of reactions, they have been around for quite a while. They were pioneered by Benkert in, in the 1970s. Uh, and when it comes to applications, we have many. When it comes to the mechanism, there are still a lot of questions of how these reactions happen. Of course, we can all draw the, the book test, uh, the, the typical um, mechanism that we know for palladium, where we will have a nickel zero complex that undergoes oxidative addition with aromatic ether to form this nickel two compound. It looks good on paper, but in reality, this is very unlikely because of course the carbon oxygen bond is, is very difficult to break and that will cost a lot of energy. So there is an alternative school of thought that is actually that first um, the organometallic reagent and the nickel, they come together, they form a nickelate that will be very electron rich and now the activation of the aromatic ether can happen with elimination of lithium alkoxide or magnesium alkoxide. Yeah? And then of course once you have your nickel to intermediate, they can go reductive elimination to form the product. And there are some calculations that support this uh, alternative mechanism, uh, but really there is very little or limited tangible information on how these lithium or uh, magnesium nickelates are and whether they can be involved in catalysis. But it's worth to say as well that in the 1980s, there were seminal papers uh, where alkali metal nickelates were prepared using nickel zero precursors, and actually they were used within the context of a small molecule activation, but not so much within catalysis. I say limited because of course there are seminal papers coming, and I'm very happy to show you this from one of our speakers, uh, Pep Cornella. He actually uh, used this low valent lithium nickelate as a catalyst uh, for um, Kumada coupling reactions. So how we entered this chemistry really was Andre um, took nickel coat, that is of course we all know a ubiquitous nickel zero precursor in catalysis, is commercially available. And very simple, we just look at the co-complexation with different amounts of phenol lithium. With one equivalent, we can form a nickel like this one here, where we still have a coat molecule coordinated. But actually, this component solution is super complicated because it's in equilibrium with these other two species that you have there, nickel coat and a dilithium nickelate. Things became a bit easier when actually we increased the amount of phenyl lithium with two equivalents. We can actually get this dilithium nickelate that you have here in the slide where you can see that nickel now has two phenyl groups and still one molecule of coat remains coordinated through one of the double bonds. And Andre can crystallize the compounds with, oh, this is not looking very good. Okay, you just bear with me. Um, these are different donors on the lithium, so this is TMDA, this is THF. The main motif is what you see here, uh, but we can, we can isolate the compounds with different donors on the lithium. With these compounds in hand, then we could look at the stoichiometric reaction of the dilithium nickelate with aromatic ether. And at room temperature, we can see very nice by NMR that we get the, homo the heterocoupling product, so homocoupling, but more importantly, we regenerate nickel coat. That of course, is very important when you think about the catalytic implications. But the surprise, or perhaps what was more surprising for us, we get with all the lithium nickelates the same selectivity, the same conversions, but the time of the reaction is totally different. With THF, with ether, instantaneous. If you have TMDA on lithium, it takes up to six days. And of course, we come from the group one metal world, so this is quite exciting because at this stage, what we could hint is that there is some type of bimetallic cooperation. And of course, nickel is doing the catalysis, but you, what happens to the lithium is playing an important role here. And what we suggest is that the lithium is perhaps acting as a built-in Lewis acid to which the sastry can coordinate, and this facilitates uh, the, the formation of the carbon-carbon double bond, single bond, sorry. We could not detect this component solution, but what we can see is that aromatic ethers are very good donors for organolithium reagents, and this is just one example of the compounds we isolated. Also, we can go from stoichiometric to catalytic reactions. We can take phenyl lithium with 2-methoxynaphthalene. We can use nickel coat as a catalyst, and we get the cross-coupled product. But again, we found that 
the donor or the solvent that you have plays a major role. In benzene, it works quite well, 70% yield. In THF, absolutely nothing, zero. Yeah, and again, that's very important because it's telling us a lot about what is happening to the alkali metal. At this stage, we started a collaboration with a group of uh, Marie Ferran and Pierre de Ampayard in Lyon. And we look at these reactions uh, combining the spectroscopic studies with theoretical calculations. And what uh, Pierre and Marie found out is actually um, the formation of the dilithium nucleate is favored. And also the displacement of cod by the substrate is energetically driven or is energetic favor. But also through these calculations, what we saw is that in order to facilitate this cod molecule to go away, the first point of entry is the coordination of the aromatic ether to the lithium. This is why it's so important what donor solvent you have or what donor additive you have. Then, once the coat is displaced, you have this activation of the substrate where the nickel pi bonds to the adding, and that facilitates the cleavage of the carbon oxygen bond that, of course, this is the great determinant step. But even this cleavage that formally is an oxidative addition is quite special because if you look at the transition state, the methoxy group is never bonded to nickel. It's almost like a sigma bond metathesis. It's really bimetallic cooperation at this prime. The two metals are working together to get there. Yeah, and then that allows for the formation of the nickel two compound that we think is the product of oxidative addition. Of course, nickel, what it does is activates the pi system, but one can see it almost like an electron shuttle between the phenyl groups and the organic electrophile. In the lab, we could not detect these intermediates, these nickel-2 compounds, but Andre had a wonderful idea. He replaced cod with CDT, that is a much more labile uh, ligand to nickel, and under those conditions, he can actually prepare or isolate this dilithium nucleate, and now look at it. We have four aryl groups and two lithium atoms, so this is nickel-2, this is the assertive addition product, and you can see now the carbon-oxygen bond of the substrate is gone. Actually, we see formation of lithium methoxide. Yeah, and if we do the same reaction and we use naphthalene that of course doesn't have a carbon oxygen bond, we can isolate this compound that is a mimic of the activation one I mentioned before where the coat is gone and the substrate is pi bonded to the nickel. With calculations, we can also model the reductive elimination step. We can see that the lithium methoxide that is generated in the reaction becomes part of the intermediate, becomes part of the eight, it's integrated in the structure of the bimetallic system, but with excess of phenyl lithium, it's displaced. And you form this compound here that is actually the one that we can structurally define and isolate under stoichiometric conditions. And then the reductive elimination uh, process has an energy barrier uh, around 16, 17 kilocalories per mole that of course is is also uh, consistent with the conditions of the reaction that we have at room temperature. Andre can also monitor this by NMR, so he can see how uh, the lithium nicolate in THF, when you add one equivalent of code, is no longer is stable, the nickel-2 compound. It evolves to the cross-coupled product and regenerates this dilithium nicolate where nickel is, again, in the oxidation state zero. Yeah? So when you put these different pieces of the jigsaw, um, we can propose a bimetallic mechanism for this Benke reaction, a mechanism that is based on the formation of lithium nicolates. First, the nickel coat reacts with phenyl lithium to generate a highly activated nickel zero compound that is very electron rich. First step, coat has to go and the organic molecule has to coordinate to the, to the bimetallic system. And this is where lithium is playing a major role. It's your Lewis acid that is built in the molecule and facilitates the reaction. Then, once the code is replaced, we have the pi interaction of the nickel, the donation into the, um, the adding, and that facilitates the ray determinant step of the reaction, which is the oxidative addition, where, as I said, it's more like a sigma bond metathesis, where you generate lithium methoxide, which is incorporated into the eight constitution, and of course now the oxidation state of nickel is two. With morphine lithium, this lithium methoxide is replaced, 
and you form this lithium nickelate that we can structurally define and characterize. And then uh, on the presence of cord, the cross coupling occurs and we get back to the beginning of the catalytic cycle. Yeah. So at least this is how we envisage a possibility of how these reactions can happen. And we just published this work very recently, last week appeared online. Just to finish, because this is a short talk, I also wanted to, to let you know that the nature, constitution, and bonding in these bimetallic systems is extremely depending on, on the type of alkyl, eral, or alkynal system that you have. If you take phenylacetylene with nickel coat, what we form is a different type of aid, this lithium nickelate that is crystallized very nicely. When we look at the structure, actually that nickel is very close to the lithium. One almost feels tempted to draw lines. But when we did some calculations, actually what we found is that there is no bonding or there is no critical bond between the point between the lithium and the nickel. In fact, the lithium nickel interactions are repulsive. And what facilitates this motif is really the um, stabilizing London dispersion forces between the TMDA and the alkynal groups. So this compound, while one can be tempted to call it a hexa, um, coordinated uh, planar nickel center is actually a trigonal, pla trigonal planar. This is the structure, but uh, we started to look at some reactions, and we can see that under stoichiometric conditions, this lithium nickel reacts with uh, aromatic halides and forms this um, nickel zero compounds that are the nuclear. And what we have here is um, we generate a coupling product that is coordinated to the nickel two center. And the strong back retrodonation of the nickel into the carbon-carbon triple bond elongates the bond, but also you can see really distorts the planarity. Yeah? It doesn't look like 180 degrees. We can crystallize it and the reaction goes very quickly with a iodobenzene. Unsurprisingly, with fluorobenzene it takes longer, but if you replace fluorobenzene by natural fluoride, the reaction only takes 15 minutes at room temperature. Stoichiometric, can we go catalytic? Yes, we can. So uh, we can actually favor the catalytic coupling uh, with nickel coat. These are some examples of the compounds that we have isolated, but what is important to know, because we have to heat at 80 degrees, nickel here becomes a bit too reactive. So we start to see some side reactions. We can see that also nickel can catalyze uh, trimerization of internal alkynes. So sometimes if you leave the reactions for very long, then you start to see that the product starts to trimerize. Yeah? And these type of reactions, we also reported them at the beginning of 2023. Okay, and the last slide, I just want to show you that this is with fluorines, but things become more exciting when you have many fluorines in your molecule. Because what you can do, when you take lithium acetylide, Final acetylide with hexafluorobenzene and nickel coat at room temperature, you can replace no one, no two, no three, actually the six fluorines in the molecule, and you get this compound that crashes from the reaction, and we can isolate as a pure compound in yields about 60%. This is quite exciting because if you try to do this with palladium and you use a more activated molecule like hexaiodobenzene, you don't get, uh, you need to go under very forcing reaction conditions and you get mixtures of products. And of course, it goes without saying that the lithium reagent on its own can only activate one or two uh, fluorines. This is the compound that was reported in 2015. So it really shows, I think, the power of bimetallic cooperation that many of you probably have heard me talking about that before, but not with the context of nickel, yeah? So this is, as I said, something that we are very excited in the group to the end. I um, want to thank my group in particular, as I mentioned. Andre, Andre, you may know him as well because he has published online a guide of how to use slangs, how to use um, slang lines that is very popular, has thousands and thousands of downloads. There's an for the uh, sponsorship and all of you for being there in the last day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Eva. We have uh, probably time for one short uh, question. We <laughs> uh, 
So um, the bond distance, the, the distance is very short. I mean, you mean in the trigonal planar, yeah? The distance is very short. It's, it's smaller than the, the sum of the van der Waals radii. So the first, I mean, even the program drops you a bond, yeah? And it was actually, when we look at more detail, when we look at the calculations, uh, that we could see that uh, there was no bonding. So I, we think that is, of course, the, the sigma bonding of the, of, of the alkyl, and also there is some back retro donation, and this is what keeps it together. But what we found that was more important is undoubtedly this London dispersion forces, how the reaction, how it's packed, and how the donor, because these systems, we can only get this motif when we have TMDA. Yeah, if you use another donor like THF or if you use another donor like Pendita, you don't get this motif. So in this case, it seems like it's the perfect fit for the lithium cations to be there. But it's really the TMDA interacting with the carbon, carbon, triple bond, with the, with the, with the um, carbon um, part of the ligand that it keeps it together. Yeah. And I think what we learn from that is yeah, that it's good to have a short distance, but you really need to look at the bonding in, in more detail because you can make wrong assumptions here. Yeah. It's been a lot of enthusiasm, so please, Manfred, if uh, and you, if you are short, <laughs> go ahead. That's a very good question, Manfred. And the problem is that these systems are extremely reactive. Yeah, I give you here the, the nice uh, picture, but uh, I mean these systems react with the Teflon of the of the steering bars. They're still reactive. So with butyl alkyl groups, we cannot isolate or detect any aid. I think they are extremely reactive. They form for sure. But when we have alkenyls and we have alkenyls that instead of phenyl groups have a long chain. Actually, what we get is clusters. We published this in Kencom this year. So we can have 10 lithium atoms, 10 alkanals, and then a nickel zero in the middle. So it's almost as you said, that's why I was laughing, like the insertion of the nickel zero within the constitution of the nickel, of the lithium compound. And yeah, but we need ligands that are not too basic or not too nucleophilic because otherwise you start to see decompositions. Yeah. Thank you. You please. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question as well. We have, I mean, I haven't, um, Andre has. So with sodium and potassium, the systems are too reactive. So when we try, for example, with phenyl sodium, what we see is that we activate one of the phenyl groups and we form a benzene. So we eliminate sodium hydride and we have like two nickel centers coordinated to the era group. So. I think we haven't found the right system yet. The problem is, as I was telling Manfred, you need to have a, an aral or an alkyl group or alkenal, something that allows you to have some stability. But it's definitely something that, that we would like to, to look in the future. Thank you, June. Okay, thank you again, Eva, for this wonderful talk. So we move to our next uh, talk. Um, our speaker is uh, Moritz Malisevsky from the Freie Universität Berlin, um, and he will be talking about uh, tenfold methylation and functionalization of ferrocene. Okay, so thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thanks to the organizers uh, for arranging this uh, wonderful meeting. So today it's my pleasure to, uh, sorry, my presentation. So. Uh, um, okay, uh, so today I'm going to talk about some highly uh, challenging methylation and functionalization reactions of uh, ferrocene. Um, so my group in Berlin is working at the interface of organometallic and coordination chemistry, but we also have a very strong interest in fluorine chemistry. So allow me in the first minute to just uh, highlight some poster contribution from yesterday in case you didn't see it. Um, so last year we introduced the perfluorinated uh, CP star anion into coordination chemistry. So this anion is quite difficult to coordinate because it's a rather weak pi donor ligand. But it has also some advantages because it's relatively weakly bound. So therefore it's rather a lay bias CP ligand, which is rather unique. So it can be displaced 
for example, by Arend, so, uh, and it can be basically switched. So you can displace the anion, it become, or you can displace the ligand, it becomes a weakly coordinating anion, it can also go, go back. And this is really a unique reactivity in uh, organometallic chemistry. Due to the high oxidative stability of this CP ion, we have also been able to make a full series of relatively stable coinage metal CP complexes, which are also very, very rare. And we have also been now able to make a mixed ferrocene here, and we are currently studying the extreme redox properties of this molecule. Okay, but now let's go to the uh, functionalization reactions of ferrocene. So basically I want to tell you two stories here. So um, both of them start here from permercurated ferrocene, so a rather unusual uh, compound. So on the right hand side, um, this route was rather discovered by serendipity, so some uh, reactions that we were surprised from the outcome. The story here on the left um, um, worked as planned, but it took us much longer than we anticipated in the beginning. Okay, so I will start um, first with the right-hand side here. So basically, in the beginning, we have to think about the methylation of ferrocene. So typically, if you want to methylate ferrocene, you're using organolithium compounds. So depending on the reaction conditions, you can either use terpetolithium or ambutolithium to lithiate ferrocene once or twice. So the question is, if you're putting in a lot of force, so uh, what, how can you, what is the maximum degree of lithiation that you can achieve? And if you're looking in the literature, you can find some old paper so they just refluxed uh, ferrocene with n butylithium excess in uh, hexane, and then you're getting some pyrophoric product mixtures. And then you can see here, they are highly lithiated, but of course, or you never reach uh, full lithiation of ferrocene. And also this reaction is unselective, so there's basically no use for this reaction. It doesn't have any synthetic value. So now we're coming to mercury, because mercury is much better for uh, methylation reaction of aromatic systems. So basically here, um, we have been studying here the, the ten, or we have achieved the tenfold mercuration of ferrocene. So the reaction is quite simple. So you start from ferrocene, you use 10 equivalents of mercury carboxylates. So typically we're using butyrate groups here. And basically in electrophilic aromatic substitution, you're replacing all 10 protons of ferrocene by these mercury butyrate groups. And you can see here, we are, after 10 steps, we have 92% uh, of yield. Yeah? So it's a basically quantitative reaction. Um, this works in multigram scale. Everything can be done in air. Uh, so these compounds are not uh, sensitive at all. Um, so as a byproduct, we are forming here butyric acid, which already shows you that also the carbon mercury bond is not acid uh, sensitive. Um, since we had some problems to crystallize this butyrate compound, um, we exchanged the carboxylate groups, for example, by reaction with trifluoracetic or trichloroacetic acid. And this works also fine. So again, here the carbon mercury bonds are not cleaved. And at the end, we also were able to exchange these carboxylate groups by halides. Um, so we were able to crystallographically characterize these compounds. And you see these very beautiful structures with uh, staggered or eclipsed uh, mercury substituents. And here in this structure, you can also see some mercurophilic interactions between the mercury atoms. So if you think now about the polarization of the carbon mercury bond, it's rather unpolar, but it's carbon minus and mercury plus. So since we are fluorine chemists, we were thinking about maybe we can electro or we can trans or we can do an electrophilic fluorination to excess decafluoroferrocene. Um, we failed miserably, so this didn't work at all. But on this way, we discovered some rather unique uh, reactivity. So in some of our attempts, we were using uh, xenon F plus SPF6, a large excess in the cetonitrile, and our starting material here was the permercuric ferrocene with trifluoroacetate groups. Um, so we got some blue crystals, and blue crystals here means you have some ferrocenium compound. Um, what was strange in the structure is that all carboxylates here disappeared, and we had just acetonitrile ligands. So if you now think about the charge balance, you have basically lost 10 anionic charges. So this was basically an 11 plus uh, cation. The structure was not very good, but we could see that, that there was a lot of SPF6 inside the, the cell. So we had to think about a more rational way to access these compounds in a pure and, uh, way. So um, we thought about starting again from the trifluoroacetate compound here and reacting them with very strong Bernstein acids. So for example, protonated acetonitrile or protonated pentafluoropyridine and liquid SO2 as a solvent. And because then you can just release trifluoroacetic acid which can be removed in vacuum because it's highly volatile. So this works very nicely. We are getting here these decacationic building blocks with these labile ligands and they can be, for example, be displaced by soft donor ligands as tetrahydrothiophene shown here. So this is a 10 plus 
cation and you see no mercury F contacts. Yeah? So the, the SPF6 is really well separated from this. So at this point, we wanted, wanted to know about the redox properties of this compound. Um, so we started the oxidation with uh, cyclic voltammetry, and you can see here the oxidation of 10 plus to 11 plus occurs at rather moderate potentials, so 0.5 to 0.7 volts. Um, at the end, we were also able to, crystal or to chemically oxidize this with molybdenum hexafluoride as an oxidant. Um, we were able to get the structure of the 11 plus cation, but this uh, picture here is a little bit simplified because here in the solid state, there are a lot of contacts to the anions. So basically here, we have contacts to SO2, which was used as a solvent, also HF, which was used as a solvent here in combination, and here some SPF6, yeah? But it's rather remarkable how stable these building blocks um, are. And basically, um, again, we see that the carbon mercury bonds have not been cleaved under these, under these very strong, strongly acidic conditions. So at this point, I was wondering, maybe we can use now this 10 plus building block as a, um, or as a building block for coordination chemistry. And basically, I thought, uh, I said to my students, maybe we can use this to make some new metal metal bonds. So for example, we could try to add uh, pentacarbonyl iron as a ligand to mercury. Um, this didn't work as expected. So we were starting here from the pentafluoropyridine as a ligand here on mercury, so 10 plus starting material. We added uh, excess of pentacarbonyl iron and something precipitated and we were never able to dissolve it again. Um, however, if we tried to dissolve it in HF, we got at least some decomposition product, which was relatively interesting. Um, so basically from the composition, um, it is a dication, here two SPF6 anions, and you can see that it was a mercury that was coordinated by two times pentacarbonyl iron. Um, Luckily, we were also able to find a rational synthesis for this compound because obviously this was a decomposition reaction. And um, the synthesis here is you just start from mercury difluoride, you dissolve it in anhydrous HF with SPF5 as a fluoride ex um, acceptor, and then this is reacted with pentacarbonyl iron anhydrous HF, and then you get quantitatively this compound. Um, at this point, we asked Gernot Franklin for help for the bonding analysis. So here you can see again the crystal structure. And well, my original idea was it is just mercury two plus it is coordinated by iron zero. But uh, Gernot Franklin said no, um, here the situation is a little bit different. So basically it's a mercury um, zero compound. Um, um, and this is then uh, the, the most important bonding interaction is that the mercury zero donates uh, to the iron one. Uh, and this interaction is much more important than the other direction so that iron donates to the mercury. Okay, so this was like the, the surprising chemistry of the organomercury um, compounds. Um, the other story is about rather organic uh, functionalizations. Um, so first we, or our target molecule here was the persylated ferrocene, and we thought maybe we can make it from decabum ferrocene and then do a simulation action. Um, so decabum ferrocene is known in the literature, but we were not so happy with the literature procedure. Um, so in the literature procedure, this was done by using mercury acetate as a mercurating agent and potassium tribromide. But I mean, this is here the 13 carbon NMR and this is obviously not pure decarbomoferrocene. Um, so we, we optimized this reaction. So actually you need to do the mercury butyrate as a mercurating agent and you are, the, the mercuration is really complete. Um, however, we saw still some impurity. Um, so here when we are using potassium tribromide as a brominating agent, still some impurity was left and it was quite difficult to identify. Um, at the end we found that with these conditions we just brominated nine out of 10 mercury bonds or carbon mercury bonds. The last one was the most difficult to brominate and here this works like with a combination of elemental bromine and iron and then we can make decarbomoferrocene in, in gram scale. Um, we also had a look on the um, redox properties. Um, so basically we can use for example arsenium pentafluoride in liquid SO2 to achieve the oxidation, and here this is uh, the crystal structure of the decarbomoferrocenium cation crystallized from HF. So the oxidation potential is rather high, 1.1 volt versus ferrocene. Um, the reaction below just shows how we identify basically the impurity. So basically we had still here one carbon mercury bond left, and this was also not cleaved by these very extreme uh, Lewis acids and fluorinating conditions. Yeah, so the carbon mercury bond is really unaffected by fluorine chemistry. Um, so then we took the decarbomoferrocene um, and our idea was we will just add a large amount of terbutyl lithium. We will just uh, basically do tenfold the lithium or the bromine lithium exchange 
and then um, quench this with dimethyl chlorosilane. Um, basically, this works, but uh, we are getting a horrible uh, mixture of compounds because also we have to do this reaction several times. So uh, lithiation, cellulation, lithiation, cellulation. And then we need to separate everything via HBLC. So we were able to get a large bunch of uh, highly cellulated ferrocenes, but also at the end, maybe 10 or 15 milligrams of this compound here. Um, the crystal structure shows that this molecule is really sterically overcrowded, so the silicon atoms are moving out of the CP plane. And um, some real interesting effect is if you're looking on the colors of these compounds. So basically, uh, normally ferrocene is orange-yellow, and you can see here for these highly cellulated uh, ferrocenes with nine or ten uh, silyl groups, now the ferrocene gets pink. And we also did the UV-vis spectroscopy, and you can see here that Basically, um, the, um, um, all the peaks are shifted now to higher wavelengths, so basically we have lower energies. So basically, in the highly, uh, or in the perstulated ferrocene, now the homolumo gap is significantly decreased in energy. Um, I mean, this reaction now is not very practical because um, you need the HPLC to, to separate all the, the, the compounds from each other. However, we found at least one good synthetic route to highly cellulated ferrocenes. So basically, from starting from dimethyl ferrocene, uh, mercurate eight times, then bromination, and then we have this compound, and then with the grinia and dimethyl chlorosaline, we can make this compound, I would say, in 60, 70% uh, yield. So maybe we can make a gram out of it in 10 milligram within one PhD thesis, yeah? So this was really a um, uh, significant uh, improvement now. Okay, so at the end, I want to uh, thank my uh, co-workers, so especially uh, Dr. Susanne Rupp, who did most of the work. And I also want to thank the funding agencies, and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Moritz. Is there, uh, is there any question? No? Okay, so uh, we'll keep going. I'm sure you'll have the chance to talk to Moritz if, uh, yeah. if uh, any other question comes to mind. Thank you again. Our next speaker is uh, Gemma Dura. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the University of Castilla-La Mancha in Spain. And um, she will be talking about a new half sandwich iridium complex with a pi extended ligand as a potent photocatalyst in green conditions. Can you hear me? Okay. So, well, thank you, Ana Carmen, for your, your introduction, and thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to share part of our work in this conference. Uh, well, uh, in the last uh, years, the situation with the energy crisis, the climate change, and the depletion of the natural resource uh, makes um, the, 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 well, we need to develop a new alternative for more sustainable procedures. And in this context, uh, photocatalysis emerges as a sustainable uh, technology that can contribute to this purpose. It's a powerful tool in organic synthesis and basically uh, uses visible light to transform molecules, reducing the waste and the cost of the reaction. So uh, the photocatalyst uh, can uh, be activated by visible light uh, from the ground state to the singlet excited state, and by an intersistent crossing can achieve the triplet excited state, and from this level uh, interact with the mo uh, molecular oxygen to uh, yield singlet oxygen or other reactive species, and it's precisely this species a, that are able to transform the reactants into the products. So uh, we focus in this type of uh, catalyst, uh, well, this family, the half sandwich iridium catalyst, uh, or uh, complexes have been reported before for many 
uh, authors, uh, Sadler, Pizarro, and so many others. And this uh, family uh, show it uh, really good anti cancer properties. They can act as a, photo, as a catalyst, but let's say in dark condition or in uh, normal conditions, okay? But none of them were photoactivatable. So we uh, were interested on, on the possibility to make this family um, um, photoactivatable. So we focus in this type of uh, ligands, uh, NC ligands, and we uh, explore the, the synthesis of, of many ligands to make this family uh, of half iridium uh, autometallated uh, complex photoactivatable. Well, so we synthesize this uh, ligand by condensation reaction of the dion and the, the uh, amine fragment to give this PVPN ligand. And uh, this ligand reacts with the precursor of iridium to obtain this chloride complex, this one. This chloride uh, ligand was substituted by a nitrogen donor ligand. Here, in this case, the benzyl hymidazole ligand to obtain our catalyst uh, two. Well, the first thing that we did was test if we uh, produce this photoactivatable uh, complex. And we quantified the singlet oxygen generation using the DPBF prof that basically we mixture this prof with our catalyst, we radiate with light, and we monitor the reaction by uh, UVBs, and we observe a really fast decrement in the band corresponding with the prof. In seconds, we consume all the prof. Uh, well, by different calculations, we determined that the uh, singlet oxygen quantum yield was really high, 99%. Well, here I presented the, the best system, our catalyst, but I need to say that we test like a, just the, the complex with the, this a nitrogen a, a ring, one um, cycle, and the second one that is the complex two. I need to say that below this second, or without these two condensate ligands or rings, the, the singlet, uh, gener singlet oxygen generation was below five. So these two uh, rings were the key to obtain a really good uh, system. So, well, we started to, well, the, the picture is, doesn't look very well, but this is our reactor. So we introduced different concentration of our catalyst. We work at room temperature. And the most important thing, we work in normal air. We don't increment the concentration of the oxygen in the reactor. And this reactor, we introduce in our Medusa photoreactor that in the bottom of each reactor, we have a LED light, and we can control the wavelength of these LEDs, so we can uh, work at different colors. Okay, so the first reaction that we tested was the coupling reaction of the benzylamine. We work in a concentration of the photocatalyst 0.05% in air at room temperature, and we irradiate with blue light. And we obtain this imine derivative, and we monitor in the reaction by NMR, and we observe a conversion of, a total conversion of the reaction in only 40 minutes. So we decided to decrease the concentration of the catalyst to 0.005%. That, that means that one molecule of the catalyst could um, react or, or, or could catalyze 20,000 molecules of the reagent. So in this condition, the total conversion was achieved in eight hours. And we compare with a commercial um, photocatalyst, the trace by reading ruthenium. And in the same condition, this catalyst achieved only the 24% of conversion. So our catalyst looks very uh, active. Okay, so well, we study different conditions of the reaction. Obviously, we need light, we need our catalyst. And we, when we added DAPCO, DAPCO is a singlet oxygen scavenger, the conversion of the reaction decreased. And that can be explained with the mechanism, the blue part of the mechanism it's related to the photoactivation of the, of the uh, photocatalyst. When we create the singlet oxygen, the singlet oxygen can react with our molecule, yielding this imine um, uh, intermediate that we cannot observe because uh, this second molecule reacts very fast with it to, to obtain the product. If we capture this singlet oxygen, the reaction doesn't work. So it makes sense with, uh, to our results. 
Okay, we explored different reactions and the other reaction that uh, I presented was the oxidation of the thioether uh, compounds uh, and we can uh, oxidize to the sulfox oh, sorry, sulfoxide uh, derivative or the sulfonate derivatives. And we were interested on this reaction because some of the drugs uh, that are important in industry contain these uh, functional groups. So we thought it was interesting. So this is the condition of the reaction and when we monitoring the reaction by NMR, we obtain uh, the conversion in 32 hours. But we observe only one signal that corresponding to the sulfoxide oxidation. Uh, so this reaction looks selecti selective to this uh, one uh, oxidation. We compare with the um, commercial uh, uh, catalyst and with the same condition, we obtain only the 3% of conversion. We explore different conditions, and when we added ADAPCO, remember the singlet oxygen scavenger, the conversion decreased to 32%. However, when we add TEMPO, TEMPO is a, re a general radical scavenger, the uh, reaction almost stopped. So we started to uh, think about the possible mechanism for, uh, to explain uh, this behavior and um, uh, well the photosensitizer can activate the uh, uh, oxygen the molecular oxygen by two pathways the bottom one is the energy transferring pathway that uh, um, the molecular uh, oxygen transform th uh, this to the singlet oxygen and later this oxidize to our uh, sulfoxide derivative that is the one that we expected at the beginning however there is another possibility uh, to activate the molecular oxygen by an electronic transference pathway. That basically uh, the, the, our product or our reagent uh, transfer an electron to the activated catalyst and this uh, radical transfer another electron to the uh, oxygen forming the super radical, uh, the superoxide radical. And these radicals uh, react uh, very fast to obtain our molecule. So, apparently, in our system, this pathway is predominant. Well, we study different um, uh, products, and just briefly, when we have the, the aliphatic sulfide, the reaction is very fast. In only three hours, we obtain the total conversion. However, when we have the aromatic uh, product, uh, the reaction is very slow. But in all cases, we just observe the sulfoxide uh, derivatives. Uh, well, so after all these uh, examples, uh, we said, okay, we have a really active system, but what else? So we started to study the recyclability of our system with other reaction, oxidation reaction, uh, uh, using this dehydroxynaphthalene to obtain, to obtain the juglone, and in one hour we have the, in this condition, we have the total conversion. So we repeat this re reaction several, several times. And we observed that the conversion was almost the same even after nine cycles. So our system is very robust. And, uh, okay, we have a good system, uh, robust, what else? So we decided to go further and try to, to work in a really green condition. So I, well, uh, I presented this, this reaction, the oxidation of the sulfoxide, but in this case, we use a mixer, mixture of solvent, acetonitrile, water 50-50. We couldn't go farther because uh, the this, this, uh, the the reagent, wasn't uh, soluble, soluble in higher content of water, but with other uh, system, we can go to a higher content of water. And we use sunlight. Our reactor, instead of uh, using the Medusa photoreactor, we put in, our, in the window of the lab and we live there, so we don't use any electric uh, source, and we are monitoring the reaction uh, by NMR. And we observe that the reaction works, and uh, the conversion was obtained in 36 hours. Comparing with the photomedusa reactor, that the, the conversion uh, was achieved in 32 hours, is quite similar. So we could use our system in a green conditions. So just to finish, and conclude, we synthesize this uh, type of complexes, iridium complexes, with a pi-extended ligand, and that 
two rings was crucial to photoactivate the complex. Uh, so with a really high efficiency in singlet oxygen quantum yield, so with excellent photocatalytic behavior and selectivity, we could reduce the system several times. And the most important thing, we uh, use a really sustainable conditions, normal air, room temperature, sunlight, water solvent, a really low uh, photocatalyst content. So just to finish, I would like to thank to my research group, Química de la Coordinación Aplicada de la Universidad de Castilla-La Mancha, especially to my students, Carlos Gonzalo and Fernando Manzano, our collaborators, the institution for the funding, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Gemma. Um, we have time for one question, if there's any. Yes, if not, not. Maybe we're a little bit sleepy this, this morning. <laughs> uh, no. All right, yes, uh, you will have the chance to talk to uh, Gemma, Gemma if, uh, if you like to. OK, so let's uh, thank uh, Gemma again. <laughs> and let's move to the, our last speaker this uh, morning. He's uh, Jitendra uh, Vera, uh, professor at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kampur, India, and uh, he will be talking about, he will be asking ligands to lend a hand. Well, thank you for the introduction. And at the outset, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to share some of our recent chemistry in this beautiful place. Uh, as, as the title says, I'm essentially asking for ligands to help us do some of the uh, chemistry. And not in a conscious manner, but that has been uh, our activity uh, for the last couple of years. So I thought I will integrate and try to give you an idea uh, that what we are doing. Mm. Of course, the concept comes from different uh, places. But what we are trying to say is that uh, you need ligand to stabilize the metal to do the catalytic reaction or to do the chemistry needed. Uh, more often that if you have some entities, uh, if that is part of the ligand, but if that can uh, participate in the reaction, uh, a, a very restricted definition is that it should also form, uh, make a bond or uh, form a bond. Uh, also, it can be photoactive, it can be electroactive uh, uh, in, in such a way that it can execute a reaction. Uh, I start with, I will have time to cover maybe three examples. Uh, I start with one example where the ligand doesn't necessarily uh, participate in a bond formation reaction, but it does help in catalyzing the reaction. For example, there are, uh, there are a variety of reactions where you need two substrates, substrate one and substrate two. And it is a requirement that at some point of the catalytic cycle, both substrate has to reside on the metal ion. But if you look at statistically, uh, it can be any uh, S1, S2, S1, both S1 or both S2 and any combination is possible. So how do you tell the ligand to direct a particular one molecule of S1 and one molecule of SO2? Now, uh, the reaction we studied uh, with a palladium catalyst, uh, Walker process, uh, this is a very well developed uh, reagent catalyst uh, we have in our lab. You see the reaction at, at a, uh, our, our room temperature and uh, it doesn't require copper or any other metal ion. If you carry out this reaction with bipyridine, there is no reaction. Reaction doesn't happen. Sigma did introduce uh, this particular type of ligand structure where you have a pyridine and you have oxazoline. And his argument was that this is the electron rich part of the ligand. This is the electron poor part of the ligand. So there will be some amount of directionality that where the olefin will bind and where the uh, peroxide will bind. We thought that is that may not be the very adequate description. We have a ligand. You see, this is essentially an abnormal carbon ligand. 
this is a pyridine unit and this is the abnormal carbon unit, you can probably have a describe it as a phenantholine, abnormal carbon form of phenantholine. Now, if you look at it here, the way we describe it that this carbon is purely sigma donor and this nitrogen, uh, this pyridine unit can act as a pi donor and a pi acceptor. And we argued that this olefin uh, interacts trans to this pyridine because th there is a, as I will show you, you can see that there is a pi corridor and then you have a sigma corridor with the peroxide. And of course, you, you can have the match or the mismatch uh, option. What this ligand does, it essentially brings this two reagent in a particular uh, fashion. Well, one can study this reaction uh, carefully and, and this, uh, this uh, mechanism as you can see uh, that very well established uh, uh, peroxy palladation followed by a ring, a ring expansion and the one to hydride shift giving you the product. Uh, these are the thermodynamic parameters that we calculated, that we measured uh, from the reaction. It was important to do to understand how the ligands are acting and this is our uh, rate determining state. If you do calculation, you see that the blue line and that is the matching one that what we predicted that the, the peroxide will bind trans to the sigma carbon, uh, uh, this carbon and the olefin will bind trans to the pyridine and you can see that this is the, uh, the match option is the stable than the mismatch uh, option. And if you just follow up the whole reaction, you will also see that the rate determining step is actually if you follow this particular uh, the sigma sigma pi pi form. When you did the calculation and tried to see figure out that what could be the structure in this form, we found something very interesting. If you look at the olefin which is trans to the pyridine nitrogen, this is perpendicular to this particular metal ligand plane. Uh, this is this we did not uh, even if you start the calculation you put it in the same plane, it actually goes back uh, to the perpendicular to this plane, whereas there is no problem all the ligands can be in the same plane for the mismatch form. We looked at the orbital very carefully and I have tried to summarize it here. If you have to form a pi corridor, what you require that the nitrogen, the pyridine nitrogen, this p pi orbital, the d pi orbital and the pi star of the olefin. Uh, has to be, if to form a pi corridor, this olefin has to be perpendicular to this molecular uh, plane. Uh, the situation is very similar, we understood immediately that it is, it is with the Jais salt. In the Jais salt, if you look at it, the Pt Cl3, that plane, the olefin is perpendicular to this plane and that is essentially to create this type of pi corridor, uh, what we are seeing it here. And then you, you can also see the sigma corridor that is creating uh, with the peroxide and the carbon carbon. And uh, of course, if you look at the second order perturbation energy, the donation and the back donation, that clearly tells you that this electronically asymmetric ligand allows the two substrate, the olefin and the peroxide to come and approach the metal in a certain direction and that allows or that actually catalyzes the uh, reaction cycle and that, uh, that is the reason why the reaction uh, was first. We have seen this ligand also work quite nicely for the other reaction where you have the requirement of two electronically separate uh, uh, disparate uh, substrate and, and, and then it is very useful. Moving from here, uh, again to, to show you that how the ligand actually can actively participate in a reaction, uh, if you look at this ligand we introduced several years back. Um, you can see that this is a ligand which is very good for carrying out oxidation reaction because it is abnormal carbon, chelate ligand, it does not decompose. In fact, we are able to identify several active species uh, under oxidative condition and that, uh, that ligand was uh, very helpful. What we did subsequently, we simply put a oxygen at this uh, ligand and this oxygen is important. What it makes it immediately, we call it as a proton res responsive ligand. Now, this oxygen can take up proton uh, from a source. And then what does happen uh, to make the story long story short, then what becomes important that uh, if any reaction that deals with the proton and the hydride, 
it becomes very easy to ma uh, manage the, or the, in the management of the proton and hydride delivery. For example, all the protons are managed at this oxygen and the hydrides are managed at this metal. So, looking at the metal ligand or employing the metal ligand cooperative action, you can actually uh, 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 transport proton and hydride in this particular, uh, particular metal complex. Just to give you a uh, little uh, description here, see this is, the st this is the compound that we isolate. You see there is a lactam uh, form, you have lost resonance energy, but you have gained or you have compensated that resonance energy by this metal ligand stronger interaction. If you put a proton, you can monitor by NMR that proton is directly going uh, to this oxygen and, and you have interconversion with the lactam and the lactic species. So, the, you can do this proton manipulation at the ligand and you can go back and back and forth. It is important to figure out what is the pK of this oxygen and for some reason that value is not coming appearing here. We figure out, we measure that the pK of this is 3 point I believe 7 3. What, why it is that pK measurement is important then you know that from which substrate you can actually abstract the proton and which substrate uh, accept the proton. Just to give you example, this reaction we studied a very simple reaction. Uh, essentially, uh, uh, you, you make a imine and you do the hydrogenation, imine hydrogenation. But to understand, because it is a protic catalyst, we carried out the reaction in three different uh, conditions. Uh, one is in the neutral condition, another is in highly basic condition and another is slightly acidic condition, triethylamine forming acid reaction. Both give the product, but as you can see, the reaction is more effective when the formic acid trial uh, uh, am, amine is agent and this is very selective if you can, you can see it here. Even if you have a carbonyl and the imine, uh, only the imine gets hydrogenated and the carbonyl uh, remains almost, almost intact. It, it is because of the mechanism. Now, I am going to show you something very clumsy and, and lot of information, but you do not need to pay uh, full attention here. Just to give you this part that when you change the condition, same reaction actually three different mechanisms are operating here. For neutral condition, you have this heterolytic cleavage of hydrogen and subsequently deliver of hydride and deliver of proton from the metal ligand uh, to the substrate. If you do it in the basic condition, it is the uh, outer sphere uh, dehydrogenation of the alcohol and, and then it goes to the hydride and then transfer of the hydride. If you take triethylamine formic acid combination, that combination or that pK is simply not strong enough to protonate that oxygen center. You can see here that oxygen is not protonated because it is not highly acidic, but you can have decarboxylation, you make the metal hydride and then this hydride is transferred to the protonated imine. It, it, it may not be able to protonate this oxygen, but able to protonate the imine and that is why it is transferred transfer there. Uh, probably you can see it here, the three different transition state the mechanism operates to depending on the pH of the reaction uh, uh, medium. Uh, you can see that is a good match with the experimental and the calculated activation energy and the NMR also shows that for triethylamine forming acid, it does not uh, go via the protonation of the oxygen center. Now, I have few minutes left. I want to tell you a, a story that we are carrying out for uh, quite a bit of time. Again, the theme here that the ligand does play an important role in this chemistry. What we do? We try to use water as a reagent and the idea is that from that water as a reagent, we should be able to oxygenate a substrate by using water or we will be used, we will be able to hydrogenate a substrate using water and the, I have only shown you the theme and I will not be able to uh, tell you the full story. If we have a ligand structure where we put a nitrogen, that nitrogen will be able to interact in hydrogen bonding way to, to make an interaction here and, and that necessarily polarizes this OH bond and this OH attacks to the substrate and it can do hydrogen oxygenation or the oxidation uh, uh, reaction. And we have, we have some success, I will show you the only the examples. A antithetical protocols is this, instead of nitrogen, if we put a boron unit here, 
then your water molecule essentially goes towards the boron and then you have a interaction between the metal and the hydrogen and that leads to the metal hydride species and that metal hydride species is able to hydrogenate a, a molecule. What we are able to do by using D2O, we are able to hydrogenate a large number of organic substrate by doing this catalysis. I will give you just few examples. You see here, we are using this ligand where the nitrogen is free, we are able to activate water and we are able to oxygenate this olefin. We are, we can, we could do hydration reaction. Again, you see every, every examples, I have a presence of this free nitrogen molecule or a free heteroatom which is involved in this activation of this oxygen. And here we did uh, alcohol to acid and also we, d we are able to do alkyne hydration. If we do not have this nitrogen, then this water reaction does not go through. Just a one example we recently published. We developed this water soluble stable nickel catalyst. You can see that this pyridine is trans to this carbon carbon that essentially makes it very labile and here this, this labile, uh, uh, this empty space, the water comes it interacts with the nitrogen and it is able to do a reaction conversion of primary amine uh, to the aldehyde. And once you, once you make the aldehyde, then you can do subsequent many reaction. But the important point I want to, make, uh, to tell you here is that this amine to aldehyde, whether you call it oxygenation reaction or oxidation reaction, that is done without any oxidant, water is fully responsible for this primary amine. Uh, to aldehyde uh, reaction. I have just no time left. I would do one advertisement for, for myself. We are organizing the next ICOMC meeting uh, 15 to 18 July uh, 2024 next year at JP Palace Agra. Uh, I would like to invite you all uh, to attend this meeting. If for any chance, if you have not received the invitation letter, please uh, tell me. I will I'll be happy to, happy to send one. Uh, with this, uh, these are my funding agency and uh, these are my students uh, who had worked uh, in, in, in different contribution from different person, but uh, all of them were involved in some way or other in developing this chemistry. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have time maybe for a short question. Is there any? Wait, 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 uh, wait, wait, <laughs> because they cannot hear you. Yeah, you're forming ammonia here. Yes. So how are you doing that? You, you see, uh, this is the deamination reaction when you, I think the, even the previous speaker had, had this reaction, primary amine, when you're going to trip, it forms imine. C double bond NH and then the, from there the subsequent uh, okay. uh, ammonia, ammonia releases. Okay. Yeah. okay, so thank you, Yitrinda, uh, I guess, for your talk. Um, please don't go yet because first I have to announce to you that during the coffee break we will take the group picture of the conference. So just uh, spruce up because uh, we will we do that. And then don't go because now. I'm going to close the don't, I'm going to close the session, but uh, Martin and Eva want to address you, right? So, on my part, just let's thank uh, the speakers of this morning for their beautiful talks, and then uh, <laughs> Martin. So, yeah, thanks guys for staying. This is just uh, as we are in the announcement of events and we started announcing already yesterday, this one here. Uh, oh, wow, wow, we put it on top. Close it. Okay. It's okay, we have there a bit of uh, too many computers. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> The thing we want to do here is to tell you a bit, we already announced yesterday a bit that uh, the next UCOMP uh, 
has been decided where it is. It will come to Bern. And I'd like, or we'd like, as co-chairs, and you see our names, <laughs> we'd like to give you a bit of a taster where this will all go to. So one important information, the dates, they're set. We'll have UCOMC 2025 from the 6th to the 10th of July. Save the date. Keep watching the space as the program evolves. So Bern, what do you know of Bern? Bern is the capital of Switzerland. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has a very pretty old town, so it's very worthy to not skip lectures, but after the lectures, maybe go to the town. Um, it is a city of students. Bern is the second largest university of Switzerland and uh, is uh, as well quite well known around tourists, so there's a bit of an infrastructure for having a good time. Uh, to get to Bern, there's an airport, but the airport is very small. You need a private jet and exactly uh, the money to do this. But uh, easier is to fly either to Basel, to Zurich, or to Geneva, which is about an hour and a bit away from Bern. From all these airports, you have direct train connections without changing anything. That brings you right into Bern. And for the Italians amongst you, uh, you can also fly to Milano, which may be a good bit cheaper, and from there you have a two and a half hour train also directly to the center of Bern. Yeah. So the conference would take place in the phone roll area. That is uh, one of our university facilities that is fantastic for this type of events. We usually employ it for our national meeting, the CS4 meeting, that we host up to 600 participants. And uh, so it's, it's a great place. Uh, lecture theaters have air conditioning, and also uh, there is plenty of space outdoors, indoors, to, to be sure that you can enjoy and network, meet new friends, and of course, um, interact with your colleagues. Um, as I said, the phone roll area is uh, within walking distance from the train station. It's also within walking distance from the city center, um, about 20 minutes, so it depends how fit you are. But if you are not, uh, when you come to, to Bern and you book your accommodation, um, whether it's an Airbnb or whether it's a hotel, you will also receive a ticket or a car that allows you for using for free all the public transport in the city. So uh, the place is also very well connected by, by public transport. Um, this is very tentative at the moment, but this is how uh, we envisage uh, the, the meeting to take place. It will be very similar format to the one that um, it was run here because it was so fantastic that we are just coping it. And, um, yeah, and uh, of course, we will also have um, plenty of opportunities for social events to be sure that we can enjoy the science, but also, of course, enjoy um, spending time with, with our colleagues. Now, one thing that we are a bit uh, considerate of is that Switzerland is not exactly the cheapest place to live and to stay. So uh, in order to make this still very attractive and affordable, we will try to get a good bit of sponsoring so that the fees can be low, so that many of you can save a lot on fees. And so if the accommodation is a tiny bit more expensive, it may be compensated with the low fees. So that's a bit the plan. We'll tell you about the exact figures in a bit. Um, the one thing that we'll also uh, try to do is to keep you fed so that within the fees there's a lot of... Uh, meals included, uh, so that you don't have those expenses uh, necessarily. Um, there's a few excursions that we can uh, advocate for, so you can have a, a tour around the city, which is usually very cheap, especially if you walk. Um, you can go and see a cheesery, so you know a bit the origins of the Emmental or other cheeses. You can go to the mountains on the Tuesday afternoon, just make sure you come back on time for the lectures. <laughs> and. You can even go and touch snow in July, which if you bring your family, this can be a very exciting event, so don't come alone and bring everyone with you. Uh, to give you a bit of an impression about Bern, uh, this is uh, the site just about 10 minutes out of Bern. It's very rural already. Uh, that's where we'd like to hold the conference dinner. So you get something for your money, we hope. And we have a bit of a video from the tourist center that should give you a bit more of an information of how Bern will look like. Now we have, just, there's no sound, but that doesn't matter. So you get a bit of the political center, so you can see how you will be welcomed, maybe. <laughs> ah, there is. 
summertime in town. So I hope this shares something for everyone. We look very much forward to see you in Bern. Huh? So see how you, well, that's the coffee break, no? That's the coffee, no, 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 wait a oh, minute, no, no, wait no, a no, minute. No, 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 this. Okay. <laughs>
just click that okay. button. Yep. Okay. Okay, that's easy. Someone took it. No, this one.
Okay. Okay. Please, um, can you all be seated and uh, we can get started with the uh, last session of this conference. I'm, I'm really pleased to have been asked to chair this, this last session, which is the climax of the conference. This will lead to the presentation of the Fisher Wilkinson Prize, uh, as you uh, all have seen in the program. And I'm particularly pleased because um, I can tell you uh, just a bit of note of personal thing that I've been in fact associated myself with both Wilkinson and uh, less directly E.O. Fisher. Uh, and just let me uh, say how, because uh, I spent in fact a year with Jeff Wilkinson, not as a postdoc, as, a, as an exchange student, and uh, I spent a year of sabbatical leave at the Technical University of Munich with Hermann, who was a PhD student of E.O. Fischer. And it is really my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, who is one of the young uh, plenary lecturers, um, Victoria Deschlein Gessner, who in fact also has association with both Fischer and Wilkinson. Um, this will become clear. I will, I will give you the details, but first let me just give you some vital records. So Victoria um, got a PhD in 2009, working under Kasten Strohmann at the Technical University of Dortmund. Then she moved to a first postdoc in the US in Berkeley with Don Tilly. Came back to Germany for a second postdoc with Holger Braunschweig in Würzburg. And then she started her own uh, career independently. Uh, got a habilitation in 2015, then was appointed as professor of inorganic chemistry at the Ruhr University of Bochum, where she is now the chair of the inorganic chemistry. So the details, in fact, uh, Victoria, uh, the, the PhD advisor, um, Carsten Strohmann, uh, had been a postdoc for Dietmar Seifert, who was himself a postdoc for E.O. Fischer. And uh, her first postdoctoral advisor, Don Tilly, got a PhD with Richard Anderson at Berkeley, who was himself a PhD of Jeff Wilkinson. So we can see here, so I mean, uh, bravo the organizers, very good planning. <laughs> so a um, few words about the uh, interest of uh, Victoria. Uh, she's interested in organometallic chemistry and catalysis. Particularly, she's worked on carbonionic and elytic uh, ligands for the stabilization of reactive main group uh, uh, compounds and the design of new cat catalysts. I think this is, will be, in fact, the topic of her talk. She has a long list of recognitions and awards. I don't want to take away any more of her time. Just mention two things which might be um, relevant. Uh, she got both a starting grant and a consolidator grant in 2016 and 2023 from the ERC and got a Distinguished Author Award from the Journal of Organometallics uh, in 2020. So Victoria, it's a great pleasure, and I'll leave you the floor. Yeah, thanks, Rinaldo, for this very, very kind uh, introduction. And I have to say, I learned something about myself that I didn't was aware of. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> so very nice. OK, so thank you, everybody. And first of all, I'd like to join um, all the other speakers in thanking Marta and her team for organizing this con uh, conference. It has been a fantastic conference. I enjoyed every minute, and I'm really thankful that I can be here. Thanks. Um, OK, so to talk, uh, today I am going to talk about ligand exchange and car at carbon. And ligand exchange is, of course, something very uh, fundamental in coordination chemistry that we all know from the first years of our chemistry studies. Um, here it is clear that if you treat any kind of transition metal complex with any L-type ligand, then you can exchange another L-type ligand or even an X-type ligand and replace um, this ligand with the new um, uh, ligand at hand. Um, we all know that this is, um, uh, of course, the consequence of the bonding situation in these complexes, um, like, and here concepts like the Dewar chet duncanson model, of course, play an important role. And this is something that we all know from transition metal chemistry, and we are all well aware. Um, in contrast to that, we usually um, regard carbon compounds or the whole organic chemistry as, um, uh, as, the, the, as covalently bound um, uh, systems. However, in 2006, Gernot Franking um, su suggested that also ulytic compounds, particularly the 
hexaphenylcarbodiphosphorane system that you see here can also be described by a dative bonding in the interaction. And uh, because we have this dative bond, carbon is formally in the oxidation state of zero, and because of that, he called these compounds carbones. This description has been uh, heavily criticized, uh, but independent of how, uh, what we are thinking about it, and I was also critical at the beginning, but you will see that I at least somehow changed my mind about this description. Um, this led people to think in a different way about carbon compounds. Um, and I think this is something very valuable to change my sometimes perspective because this can generate new ideas. Uh, and so many people took this um, up and, um, and created new compounds with interesting bonding situation that also led then to new reactivity studies and quite interesting compounds, particularly also in, in main group chemistry. So we also became interested in the field of ulitic compounds, but not uh, in the uh, simple ulits that we all know from, from Wittig reaction, but um, uh, compounds which are uh, furthermore deprotonated at the, at the ulitic carbon center, so just replacing this R, this proton, if R is a proton here, with a metal center. And uh, the reason why we became interested in these uh, metallated ulits was, um, uh, yeah, was a motivation from main group chemistry, because since we have here um, uh, formally two lone pairs at carbon, one of a sigma, one of pi symmetry, we, we, uh, we, um, we assume that this should be excellent sigma and pi donor ligands, similar to amino substituents, which are ubiquitous in main group chemistry and often used uh, to stabilize low valent, um, low valent compounds such as carbenes. Yeah? And so we thought, yeah, let's do the same with ulits, and uh, we are sure that we will probably impart new reactivities in these compounds because usually the ulit should be a stronger donor, so we will create highly nucleophilic species. So that was our motivation, so pretty much fundamental, um, a fundamental studies on these metallated ulits. And at that time, um, only few metallated ulits were known in literature. Um, in fact, only these two systems are reported by Gibertro and Edgar Nike were also structurally authenticated. But these are rather specialized, or I would say rather specialized systems which had only been um, synthesized in milligram scale, so nothing that you really would like to use um, uh, to, to, to broadly explore the reactivity. But it has been shown before that ULITS indeed has potential to create something, um, something interesting in main group chemistry, in, in part new reactivities, um, uh, such as in, uh, uh, in tetraline chemistry. This was shown by Trees, Kawashima, and Fürstner in case of carbenes and xylylenes. So motivated by all these um, uh, um, reports um, uh, in, uh, in the past, we set out to isolate metallated ulits. And that's, that was the, the beginning of a, of a yeah, now seven, eight year um, long story, which really evolved into many research directions. Um, as, really, um, uh, as really planned, we also, uh, of course, used the metallated ulits in main groups chemistry to stabilize low valent and also cationic compounds. In the past years, we really could show that you can create interesting species with interesting bonding situations and therefore also, of course, um, interesting reactivities. But I'm not going to talk about that today and I will also not talk about that um, more or less serendipitously we came across that um, ulits are also powerful substituents in phosphine chemistry because if you, if you attach an ulit to a phosphine, you significantly can increase the donor strength in a phosphine and these, we call them Y-phos ligands, are superb ligands in gold and palladium chemistry um, and um, with that, we have done um, in the past couple of years uh, many coupling reactions, hypoaminations in, ca in case of gold. So in, if you're interested in this, we have also yeah, summarized um, our results in a recent um, research, uh, review article. Today, I will only focus on one part of our research, namely how we come from methylated ulits to create novel reagents. And here, the ligand exchange reactions of what I, I was talking about before plays a vital role. Okay, but let's start with how we synthesize these metallated ulits. And um, this always looks pretty simple on paper, but it took quite a bit of time to really, um, to really um, optimize reaction conditions in the first, uh, for my first PhD student who was working on that project. But essentially, it's just a simple double deprotonation step. So you start, like in this case of this tosyl substituted compound, you start from a phosphonium salt and deprotonate once and twice. And then you get to this um, metallated ulit, and depending on the base that you're using in the last step, you can get the lithium, the sodium, and, and also the potassium compound. Um, and we can isolate these compounds in, in gram scale, which is, of course, a nice feature and which makes them also then applicable in broader, in broader case. 
Here you see also the crystal structure, and this is why I love alkali metal, metal chemistry, because of the structural diversity. So depending on the metal, depending on the, um, on the coal ligands that you have, depending on the solvents, we always see quite, um, quite a variety of different structures that these compounds can form. For example, this monomeric crown ether potassium complex that you can see, which uh, coordinate, is coordinated by the ulidic carbon atom, as well as the salsonyl group. The same coordination mode is also seen here in the sodium compound, but that's a bit more complex since we, ha we have now here um, eight uh, molecules um, forming, uh, forming a, an oligomeric or an um, octameric species. Um, I only want to shortly um, uh, um, address the bonding or the, uh, the structure parameters uh, because they are quite interesting and they will become um, important later on. So if we compare the, the bond distances in the central phosphorus carbon sulfur linkage, we see that upon each deprotonation step, we have a significant decrease in the bond distances. And of course, this is expected since the charge at the carbon atom increases. You can see here the calculated charges in this last um, uh, row. Um, and you see that with, uh, the, the charge increases, and because of the increased charge, we have um, an increasing electrostatic interactions, which of course results in, this, um, in the contraction of these bonds. So they become shorter and yes, presumably also stronger. Um, uh, we were all interested in, of course, modifying the metallated ulids, um, also in order to, uh, um, to understand how the, uh, the substituent at the ulidic carbon atom changes the bonding situation towards other entities, but also within the metallated ulid. And um, this is quite easy to see uh, from two, two compounds. Again, we see the sulfonyl substituted system, and what you see is that we have um, that the two highest occupied molecular orbitals, they represent the two lone pairs at the carbon, and they are pretty much localized at the carbon atom, which you would expect because of the strong anion stabilizing ability um, of the sulfonyl group. Uh, a somewhat different picture is seen when we go to the cyano co compound. The cyano compound, of course, is much more um, um, able to delocalize the negative charge via conjugation, and therefore you see that the two highest molecular orbitals are not as much localized, but much more delocalized into, towards the, the end end of the cy um, cyanomoiety. So this is just to show you that we can change the electronics of our metallated ulid, and that with that, of course, the bonding, but also the, um, the donor properties of the species. Okay, I addressed already the bonding situation. That at the beginning, I said that ulidic species have been shown to feature dative, um, at least in part, dative in, uh, types interactions. And um, since these um, carbodiphosphoranes have been described as, as carbones with dative interaction between phosphines, then of course the question arises, can we also describe our metallated ulids as carbones? And in order to clarify the bonding situation, we teamed up with Gernot Franking. We have heard the name quite often on this conference, although he's not here, he's, I think he's quite present. Um, so uh, together with Gernot Franking um, and Diego Andrada, who was um, a postdoc with him at that time, we started to look into the bonding situation. And of course, it's a bit more com complicated than uh, the parent hexaphenyl carbodiphosphorane because uh, we have an unsymmetrical compound and therefore we also have to consider unsymmetrical bonding situations. So in total, we, uh, um, we, uh, um, we investigated nine different bonding situations and I'd just like to point out that this double bond that you can see here in case to the phosphine uh, represents the negative hyper conjugation into the sigma star orbital of the phosphorus carbon bond. Uh, but you see, we have considered dative bonding, ulidic bonding, and this type of double bonded systems. And uh, to make a long story short, what came out of this study, so we looked into the molecular orbitals, MBO analysis, energy, de energy decomposition analysis, and uh, what we saw is that you get uh, fragmentation patterns um, uh, for all of these compounds, and usually several of these fragmentation patterns have similar energies, saying that uh, the bonding situation is not a clear-cut picture, but um, different structures contribute to the true bonding situation in these compounds. However, and this re was really what made us think, um, this, um, this um, structure here, which you can uh, also um, describe as a carbonyl anion stabilized by a, by a phosphine, that came up repeatedly in this system. And of course, if this is true, so if this is a part, of, um, a part of the bonding situation or contributes to the bonding situation, then you can ask yourself the question, can we use this as a carbonyl anion transfer reagent, so replace the phosphine, and do chemistry with this species? 
And uh, we have tried that for many years. Um, uh, and of course, the, the, the ligand with which you would replace the phosphine, if you were, again, go back to transition metal coordination chemistry, so the best ligand would probably be a carbonyl, uh, carbon monoxide. I mean, in transition metal chemistry, we often see phosphine CO replacement and vice versa. So we wondered, can we replace the phosphine by CO to, to, um, to access these catenyl anions? And of course, this would be very interesting compounds to isolate because um, since they are highly nucleophilic, you can treat them with any electrophile and probably get access, easy access to, um, to ketenes. Um, I should, of course, uh, ketenes are known species. There have been many reports on different synthetic pathways to ketenes, uh, but all of them have their limitations. And if you just think of how we usually introduce a phenyl group or a methyl group, then, of course, we like to use um, uh, organo, so phenyl lithium, methyl lithium, or the Gringer reagents. And, of course, the same holds true for this catenyl anion. If we would have a spe species like this, this would facilitate the formation of ketene species. At this point, I also like to mention, because I'm a big fan of main group chemistry, there has been um, fantastic um, chemistry with the S and the P block elements with carbon monoxide. So you see here a couple of structures and, and people who have, um, as I said before, f done fantastic work with carbon monoxide. We have seen a couple of examples um, during, this, um, during this conference. But the problem or often when doing chemistry, um, activation chemistry with main group elements is that you create new structures with uh, unusual bonding situations, but it's often difficult to release the, uh, the activated compound or to create any reagent, versatile reagent out of that. So being able of generating something, um, something valuable out of that would of course very highly desirable. So catenyl anions in general are or have been elusive species. There has been one report um, of a structure elucidation of a catenyl anion in the coordination sphere of a transition metal that dates back to 1993 by Grambotta, but since then no structure report has been, um, uh, yeah, has been reported in literature. Um, they have also not really been isolated there, um, but um, only uh, been synthesized in situ, uh, for example, by carbonylation of lithiated diisomethanes, but then always trapped at low temperature. Closest to isolating a catenyl anion species came Doug Stefan in, uh, in 2021, um, who started from a methandiite species and um, uh, yeah, via a quite unusual carbonylation and oxidation reaction, um, he uh, isolated this, um, this benzene derivative um, and, and um, yeah, proposed this, this um, inolate species as intermediate. So we thought, okay, maybe we are really, um, we have the possibility to really use our, our metadata ulits as carbonyl anion transfer reagent and thus access catenyl anions, maybe also in gram scale and do organic chemistry essentially that, use it in organic synthesis. Um, so um, Mike, um, uh, who also presented a poster, so maybe you had the chance to meet him at the poster um, this week, Mike used this metallated ulit, which he had synthesized more or less for coordination chemistry purposes, but nonetheless, we tried to do the carbonylation with this uh, metallated ulit, and we were re really pleased to see that, indeed, we get a selective reaction. So we quickly observed the formation of this phosphine, so we, we, said, we, we, we thought that this might be the catenyl anion that we, that we get. However, this is a more complicated uh, metallated ulit, so we thought, if, since this is a clean formation, maybe we can access this catenyl anion via a more simple um, route. And indeed, we can just starting from this methyl phosphonium salt. Then you synthesize this phosphino substituted um, ulit, which you then in one spot um, deproton or sulfur, sulf to the sulfuration, deprotonation, carbonylation in one step, and then you can um, isolate this compound in an 80% yield, also in gram scale. And luckily, this compound um, drops out of THF. It crystallizes even out of THF, so that we, could, we are able to determine the crystal structure. It's complicated, it's a polymeric structure, but if we zoom into the asymmetric unit, we clearly see that this is our catenyl anion that, the, that we were aiming for. What we also see is that we, the potassium cation is coordinated by the oxygen end of the, of the catenyl uh, moiety, but also by the carbon end. And most interestingly, if we look closer, then we see that we have a rather large phosphorus carbon carbon linkage. And that um, raised the question, is this truly a catenyl anion or is it maybe an inolate species? Yeah. And so we, um, if we, if we um, just consider the parent compound, so the neutral compound, a ketene, 
then the ketene structure is by far more stable than ethanol. Ethanol itself has only been detected under matrix isolation or interstellar ices, so ket the ketene structure itself is much more stable. So uh, we uh, wanted to elucidate the structure more clearly and, and um, try to get a monomeric structure which was possible uh, by, uh, by adding crown ether. And what you see, of course, is here that we have um, only now the coordination to the carbon and atom. But this is, of course, somewhat biased because we have this, um, this additional thiophosphoryl moiety which directs also the, the uh, potassium to the carbon atom. So looking at the structural parameters, we see that um, we have a rather short carbon-carbon bond here. So this is definitely shorter than a double bond. But we also have a short carbon-oxygen bond, also shorter than a double bond. Yeah? So this indicates that it's neither a true catenal Ni nor an inolate species. Yeah? And also all the other um, uh, spectroscopic parameters were not 100% uh, um, um, uniformly showing into one direction. So we concluded that this is an, probably an intermediate bonding situation that we have. So we looked uh, more closely by DFT calculation and we looked um, into the unbiased system, which means the protonated species, and compared the protonated catenal anion uh, with the ketene species and the ethanol species. And I'd just like to focus uh, your attention to the uh, Weiberg bond indices, which you see here in pink. And here it's shown for the catenal anion in comparison to ketene and the ethanol. And you clearly see that this value is well in between. So the value for the carbon-carbon bond is well in between uh, that of the ketene and the ethanol, further confirming that we have an intermediate bonding situation. The uh, topological analysis um, shows um, for the bond critical point, again looking at the carbon-carbon bond, um, an ellipticity, ellipticity um, close to zero, suggesting that it's more a triple bond. Yeah? So it's def what shows that it's defi definitely not a, not a true catenal anion, but something in between. I'd also like to mention or highlight the positive charge at this carbon center here. Because what makes ketene so reactive is their ambifilicity, the positive charge at the, at, the, at the carbon atom here. And because of that, if you do not um, electronically or sterically protect a ketene, this dimerizes. But upon, and this is of course something that you could expect, upon deprotonation, um, uh, this um, positive charge significantly decreases. And this results, of course, in the fact that um, the catenal anion now become really stable. So although we only have one substituent, we can isolate the species so it doesn't dimerize by itself. Of course, also because of steric, um, electrostatic um, repulsion of the anions, but still this is something that I really like to highlight here. Okay, so I'm coming back to the um, uh, ligand exchange reaction. And uh, we have synthesized the catenal anion. I think that's a quite interesting reaction by, ex by exchange of the phosphine with carbon monoxide. So uh, of course we, we were then eager to see whether we can ex extend this reactivity to other sub set substituents. And we were particularly interested in the sulfonyl system that I have shown you of one of the first slides, so the, the tosyl substituted compound. And um, here we observed um, selectivity issues. And um, when you think of the mechanism and how this carbonylation reaction might proceed, this is something that you could expect because if you think um, these metallated ulits that we have, they are highly nucleophilic species. So in the first place, this will attack at the, uh, at the carbon monoxide, but the carbon monoxide will then try to back donate um, and then kick out one of the substituents. And this, it can kick out, of course, the phosphine as we've seen before. But we have now a, um, a tosyl group, which is also a very good leaving group. So depending on which substituent the, you release from the molecule, you either form the catenal anion that we, of course, desire to have, or you're releasing the corresponding metal salt together with the phosphorylidine ketene, which are also interesting compounds, but of course not re no reagents that you can use on further. So we wanted to understand the selectivity uh, more in detail, and particularly how we could control the selectivity. And um, uh, and Felix um, did a, uh, a nice systematic study on, on different parameters. And at first he looked into the influence of the nature of the phosphine. And if you look here into the table, so the one A molecule is the one with a tricyclohexyl uh, substituted phosphine. And you see here that we get selectivity almost exclusively for the tosyl um, elimination. So we get to, uh, to the um, uh, phosphorylidine ketene. If we, however, go to the, uh, to, to the phenyl, triphenyl uh, phosphonium group, so a better leaving group if you want so, 
Um, then we have a, see a switch in selectivity and now we get um, selectivity, not perfect selectivity, but we see selectivity now for the catenyl anion. We don't understand um, why if we introduce a fluorinated substituent, uh, which we expect it to be an even better uh, leaving group, we, we see a drop in selectivity, we don't understand this. But um, upon further studying, we noticed that besides looking into the phosphines, also the alkali metal has a decisive impact um, on the selectivity. So if we go from lithium here with the 80 to 20 selectivities to sodium and potassium, we see an increase towards the selectivity for the catenyl anion to a 90 to 10 mixture. And if we, um, uh, if we change to polar solvents and add crown ethers, um, uh, we finally get to, uh, to the point where we get 100% selectivity to the, for the catenyl anion. And the reason why we see this trend, um, at least we assume this, uh, that uh, the reason for this is that we have to uh, uh, make sure that the, uh, that the potassium cation does not strongly bind to the, to the tosyl leaving group. So if we, if we manage that um, this interaction between the tosyl group and the metal is weakened by the solvent, so that's why we are using a polar solvent, or um, we even use a crown ether to really rip off the, the, uh, um, the, the metal center, then we get selectivity for the catenyl anion. So we can control this um, ligand exchange reaction, which is very nice to see. And if we apply the optimized conditions, then we can indeed isolate uh, the tosyl substituted catenyl anion in a 92% yield as a, clean, um, as a clean product. We could also crystallize this compound, and this time with a an, uh, an cryptan, and this allowed us to crystallize the, the naked catenyl anion without any contact to the metal center, which I think is, is an interesting molecule because, because now um, the bonding situation is not disturbed by any metal, uh, metal um, ligand interaction. And interestingly, what you see here is that we see a rather large um, sulfur carbon carbon angle, almost 180 degrees, which makes you, of course, assume, okay, that's now an inolate species. Yeah? So we looked into that in detail and uh, compared it um, to our, the first compound that we published and compared it as well to a report by Leo, um, who shortly after our first report reported on a similar system, um, but having now an interaction between potassium and oxygen, where we had the potassium binding to carbon. Now we had a system where we don't have any interaction at all. So we thought that this is a nice um, uh, comparison. And I, I know this is a, a busy slide, but I'd just like to highlight um, that the most, um, there's no real systematics in these, in these bonding that we see from the crystal structures. At least we couldn't figure out any real systematics. And the, uh, the most difference you see really in this um, sulfur carbon or phosphorus carbon carbon angle. And uh, this large value that we have here, this is really, um, yeah, um, yeah, that, that really doesn't really fit in, in the trend at all. And it's even surprising because if we then look at the, at the Weiberg bond indices, we see that they are almost the same for all these, type, all these compounds, which was something that I didn't expect in the first place. However, when we run the optimization of the molecule, we saw that the independent of the functional or the basis set that we used, these, this structure always optimized to a totally different angle. And um, if you run the scan, of the spending energy, then you see that we ha have a really shallow energy surface. A bending from, let's say, 130 to 180 kilojoule per mole is, uh, to 180 degree is within a, a one kcal per mole window. So this means that even packing effect can nicely change or can easily change uh, the angle and thus um, have an impact um, on the structure of this molecule. So the angle itself doesn't say anything about, uh, that's the bottom, bottom line of the story, the, the angle doesn't tell anything about the real bonding situation of these molecules because it's easily influenced by, by um, other factors. And similar effects we saw in a recent study um, where, uh, where we again focus on the phosphoryl substituted system but now change sulfur by oxygen, selenium and also this entolyl substituent. Um, here the compounds most, uh, mostly um, um, showed um, angles between 140 and 150 degrees, um, there, and there isn't a much of a difference in the bonding situation uh, depending on the substituent. Okay, now I'd like to come to uh, one of my favorite molecules. Uh, this is the cyano compound that I have also shown you on one of the former slides. Um, and um, of course, carbonylation is a very interesting reaction with this compound. And um, what, what comes out of this reaction is a sausage molecule. <laughs> so we are forming a crystal structure where, where we have 
the potassium cation, again, complex by crown ether or even krypton, so we have many structures. This uh, determines the lattice, and then in between we get the molecule, and you get what you expect, this five atomic anion, so the cyan cyanocatenyl anion. It's, I think it's a truly an interesting molecule, five atoms, one negative charge, but it's, an, it's a crystallographic nightmare because it can look like this or that, and it does that all the time in the structure, independent how you crystallize. So there's no way that we can really give any information about the bond lengths in this compound because it always crystallizes as it was and, in, um, and also independent of the structures that we are forming and because you can also not really distinguish between having nitrogen or oxygen on one or the other side. Oh, I'm getting a signal. But you did a long introduction, right? You did a long introduction. I think I still have a couple of minutes. I, I still have to come to the, to the, to the reactivity. <laughs> okay, I'm making fast. So, um, um, bottom line, we now get to this cyanocatenyl anion, and it's, I think it's interesting because cyanocatenyl is a, is a compound which is discussed by astrochemists um, um, uh, being um, of importance for prebiotic chemistry because you can envision that, pro, that uh, treating that with water you get better amino acids and so on. And this is now a stable compound that we can actually isolate and do chemistry with, and I think that's really, really unique. And of course the bonding situation, and I don't want to talk now about that, because I don't have time, but it's still also very interesting for this type of compound. Okay, now um, at last I'd like to come to the reactivity, and this is of course what is of interest. So can we really use this catenyl anion? And I said, it's something, the bonding situation is between a catenyl anion and an inolate. So would it now react really as a catenyl anion and, and give us um, catenes as, um, as products? And yes, it does, and it does it with perfect selectivity and imperfect yield. So simple salt metathesis gives us this trittle compounds, also with a methoxy group, without seeing any orthomethylation reaction, for example. We can do that with chlorosilanes and uh, isolate the silyl substituted ketenes. I should focus, uh, I should emphasize that we focused on, on, um, on, uh, um, on electrophiles, which would give us isolable ketenes and not reactive ketenes. But these selectivities and the yields are really, are really great and they could easily be isolated uh, from the reaction mixture. We can also get to a bit more complicated structures. For example, if we uh, trap the catenyl anion with a chlorophosphine, we presumably get this uh, phosphino substituted ketin as intermediate, but which dimerizes then to this heterocyclic compound. We can even do more interesting reactivity than just simple salt metastasis. If we treat it with as disulfate, we get um, addition of the sulfur-sulfur bond to the carbon bond, and we even get addition of, the, of carbonyl compounds um, across the carbon, uh, carbon bond of the catenyl anion, which is quite remarkable, and we are looking into the selectivity, so maybe we have been at the poster of Sunita, so she had a bit of that chemistry on her, her, her poster. Of course, um, also extending that then to other substituents was important, and for example, the, also the tosyl um, substituted compound reacts with high selectivity and gives us the products in, in high yields. But the selectivity is a bit different um, of this tosyl substituted compound, which mainly is because of sterics. If you has a, have a smaller um, catenyl anion, um, this more easily reacts with the in situ than formed ketene and forms these um, these cyc di um, cyclobutadiones um, systems um, because the ketene is then attacked by another equivalent of the catenyl anion. But this, um, these reactions also proceed very well and it also can isolate these compounds in high yields. Uh, and we are, uh, um, we are isolating them now to also study um, more in detail um, their electrochemical properties. An interesting um, uh, um, uh, synthesis that we observed is the reactivity towards a really um, strong Brunstead acid. So Bruchardt's acid reacts um, with the catenyl anion um, under formation of this ketone. We don't know the mechanism, but somehow two molecules react with each other and spill out one of the one CO molecule again so that we get to this, um, uh, to this ketine, uh, ketone species. Okay, so with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Um, I hope I could show you that ligand exchange at carbon is a viable process and this gives us access to cat catenyl anions. We can control the ligand exchange if we uh, choose the reaction conditions wisely. Um, the catenyl anions do possess a bonding situation between a catenyl anion and an inolate, but nonetheless react like true catenyl anions to give rise to ketenes, but also other interesting um, carbonyl containing compounds. And when preparing this talk, I thought that maybe I'd suggest 
that methylated olid since carbo diphosphorines are carbones, and if you think that this is an anionic species, then there are new types of carbonates <laughs> in, in uh, similarity to eight complexes, but carbonate is of course something totally different, but nonetheless I find, I find it funny and we can discuss that maybe later. Okay, with that, um, I'm at the end of my talk. I'm super grateful to all the co-workers um, who have done the work. I have done nothing to, um, experimentally in, in, the, um, in the lab, but only on the paper. Uh, I'm very thankful to the ERC. The ERC funded all the projects without knowing that this com might come out or any, any nice ligand systems might come out. So really fundamental work. Um, I'm uh, particularly thankful also today for, um, to Gernot Franking, with whom we had lots of discussions and um, um, also inspirations. Um, and with that, I'd like to end with a recent group picture and like to just um, shortly highlight the people who have done the work. Mike, you have maybe seen in the conference and maybe also visited at his poster. He has um, done the initial experiments on the carbonylation reaction. Felix has stepped in with the tossile um, system. Um, uh, Prakash, he's working on the carb anionic phosphine. Sunita is doing carb, uh, the carbonyl reactivity um, of our catenyl anions. And um, she has also done uh, the work with the, um, um, with the um, phosphoryl system. And, um, and Manoush, who's also here, um, he has done uh, the entolyl system. I hope I didn't forget anyone. Um, I hope that you also visit the poster of Maurice, who's doing the YFOS ligands, um, an expert for that in, the, in my group. And with that, I'm now really at the end. Uh, thank you for being patient uh, with me, and I'm happy to answer any question that you might have. Thank you for really, really beautiful, outstanding work. And uh, you, you did start 10 minutes late, so we are now at 43. So uh, it, we ran out of time, but I cannot uh, uh, avoid having uh, just a very short discussion if there are questions in the audience. Uh, there is one down there. We are at the end of the conference, so, so what? Open end. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, maybe I missed that, did you see any difference in carbon and MR, and do you think that actually solid state carbon and MR would help you in understanding the bonding situation of that carbon in that position? Oh, that's you. a good suggestion. We only did in solution carbon and MR, so I can't tell if there's any difference to the solution NMR. Yeah, that, that might be. That's, I mean, what we did, we did, um, and, and there you are t uh, totally right, um, we did um, IR studies in solution and in solid state, that's easy to do, and there we indeed saw differences. And I, I didn't mention, but we see actually in the solid state two um, of the molecules, two uh, catenyl anions, and they have quite different, um, uh, different um, uh, sulfur carbon carbon angles. And we see two signals in the, in the, in the carbonyl region um, for in the IR spectrum, which suggests that we indeed have differences in the, in the solid state versus the, um, the uh, solution um, IR. Yeah, that's a good, good question, thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands up, and uh, I, I don't know if there are questions from the other uh, room. I, I don't even know how you find out if there are questions. <laughs> so please join me in thanking Victoria for a really fantastic <laughs> presentation. So now it's really my great pleasure to introduce uh, the uh, Fisher Wigginson Prize. Um, and uh, um, I would like to just say a few words uh, about the prize because maybe then Martin Albrecht will give you some more details. But uh, uh, this has been now um, uh, insto been installed as, as the highest uh, um, recognition of, our, of the division of organometallic chemistry of UCAMS. Uh, since uh, I think the first edition was in, in Bratislava. And so the first prize was given to Malcolm Green, who was a former PhD student of Wilkinson. The uh, second, uh, not, not the second, the third one was given to Ernesto Carmona, who was a former postdoc of, of Wilkinson. Then uh, last, uh, the last one was given to Pierre Brownstein, who was a postdoc for E.O. Fischer. And, and so now we have the pleasure that uh, we have Helmut Werner, who, who was a PhD student of Helmut Fischer. That makes it perfectly symmetric. But this is certainly not the reason that led the committee to give the prize to, to Professor Fischer. Martin Albrecht will, will 
uh, give a, a laudatio with, with the real uh, um, uh, scientific region reasons that were really outstanding for, for this uh, attribution of the prize. So just a few words about the uh, curriculum. Um, uh, Professor Werner uh, studied chemistry at the University of Vienna, um, then uh, got a PhD with E.O. Fischer, as I just said, in Munich. Then, when in, this was 1961, then he went to postdoc with uh, John Richards at Caltech in the US, returned to Munich to get a habilitation in 1966, then got appointed, started his career in uh, Switzerland at the University of Zurich, um, where he stayed until 75. He was promoted to rise the ranks up to uh, full professor in 1970. In 75, he was called to be professor and then head of the Inorganic Chemistry Institute at the University of Würzburg. Um, as I said, the, the scientific uh, uh, reasons for the prize will be uh, mentioned by, by Martin Albrecht. I just want to mention that he was, uh, has been visiting professor in numerous universities, Cambridge, Santiago, Saragossa, and I pleasingly learn also to lose. Um, and he got a very long list of prizes. I won't mention them all, just the main ones, maybe the ones that I perceived to be the main ones. He got the Centennial Medal of the Royal Society of Chemistry in 1993, uh, the Max Planck Forschungsprize in 1994, the Paolo Chini Memorial Lectureship of the Italian Chemical Society in 1995, the Gordon Stone Lecture uh, in 2004. So you see prizes for all sorts of different countries. Uh, he's been a fellow of the Royal Society since 1998, a member of the Academia Leopoldina, uh, and he got uh, degrees honoris causa from Saragossa in 2001 and from his alma mater, the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena in, in 2006. Now I hand, up, I, I hand the floor to, to Martin, who will uh, uh, present the prize. Thank you, Rinaldo, and um, for elaborating very nicely. Of course, me as the chair of the Division of Organometallic Chemistry, I feel particularly honored and pleasure to say a few words about the scientific uh, uh, credentials of uh, Professor Werner. He has been one of the pioneers of modern organometallic chemistry. Uh, he made important contributions to novel compound types, such as like the first uh, borazine half sandwich complex and the first triple decker cyclopentadienyl complexes that were all uh, done in uh, Werner's laboratories. He also performed remarkably broad systematic studies on the reactivity of late tra um, uh, transition metals including neutral ligands such as CO, phosphines, olefins, and carbenes. And these innovations included metal-based uh, met, metal basicity as well as kinetic label ligands, which basically had the foundation or laid the foundation to establish uh, general areas and concepts of homogeneous catalysis. Already in his very early days, he started studying carbon-carbon bond coupling reactions, including carbenes, vinylidines, and the likes, which later inspired many organic transformations. So the synthetic procedures, just as an example, uh, for ruthenium carbene complexes that we use now for olefin metathesis, uh, so Grubbs type metathesis ca uh, catalysts, these synthetic procedures have been developed by Werner and are now widely used as well in industry. So you see quite the footprint. And as such, the Division of Organometallic Chemistry is thrilled, and we are honored to award Helmut Werner with this Fisher Wilkinson Prize of Organometallic Chemistry in 2023, specifically in recognizing his outstanding contributions to organometallic chemistry, in particular his groundbreaking work on kinetically label and reactive ligands and metal-based basicity, which helped to lay the foundation of modern homogeneous catalysis. Professor Werner. I ask you to come on stage, please.
this is only part of the price. The other part is, of course, the award itself, the, the, how should I say, the financial contribution, but that doesn't come on here because that should come higher. So we're very pleased to offer you this award or to present you this award and to invite you to give your award lecture, please. Dear Marta, dear Professor Albrecht, dear Rinaldo, dear colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank everybody who was involved in the decision to present the Fisher Wilkinson Prize to such a dino like me. <clears throat> I consider this in recognition of the work which we have done or which I have done <clears throat> for a great period of my life together with excellent students and excellent postdocs. <clears throat> the 50 years which I mentioned in the title of my lecture should be considered as the time of period between 1952 and 2002. In 1952, I started at the university as a first year student, and in 2002, I became Professor Emeritus, had not been immediately shifted out of the department, but only slowly continued in the next few years. <clears throat> 1952, at that time, the chemical world seemed to be well organized. There were these two historic giants, organic and inorganic chemistry, and in between, there was a new, vivid discipline called physical chemistry, which became more and more important in the first half of the 20th <coughs> century. <clears throat> 1952 was also important in so far as at the turn of the year 52 to 52, 51 to 52, two papers appeared, <clears throat> one in the Nature and one in the Journal of the Chemical Society. Luigi Venanzi later wrote in a review that he is convinced that the majority of the readers of these two journals did not take notice of these two papers. 
Peter Paulson, an assistant professor in the United States, an organic chemist, he attempted, <clears throat> he attempted to couple two cyclopentadienyl units to a C10H10 molecule using iron trichloride for this coupling, but also for the attempted oxidation or dehydrogenation of C10H10 to give a new compound called fulvaline, which was supposed to have aromatic properties. Instead of obtaining this desired compound, he obtained a yellow powder and was very surprised that this powder was not only air stable, but could be sublimed at about 100 degrees in vacuum without any change and which was also soluble in organic solvents. The other group, led by Samuel Miller at ICI, in those days a giant in industrial chemistry, he attempted to react alkanes or alkenes with dinitrogen to obtain aromatic or olefinic amines. He used about the same conditions which were used for the Haber-Bosch process to prepare ammonia from dinitrogen and dihydrogen, which means that he worked under high pressure and higher temperatures. And like Haber and Bosch, he used steel tubes and observed, he was very disappointed, that very soon he had the catalysis in these tubes, that very soon the tunes were completely blocked. Even under 300 atmosphere of pressure, almost no dinitrogen or the corresponding aromatic compound could pass this powder, yellow-orange powder. Both of these persons or teams made only a very vague <clears throat> attempt to explain the structure of these remarkable substance. Pawson used this words. <clears throat> But these structural proposals didn't say uh, very less. They were not comparable to any of the <coughs> ideas about chemical bonding, which was <coughs> obvious in those days. But there were two people, two people besides the big majority of chemists who could have read these two papers, two people, and that was Ernst Otto Fischer in 1951, a lecturer at the nowadays Technical University in Munich, and <coughs> Jeff Wilkinson, in those days, an uh, assistant professor at Harvard University and tightly bound to <coughs> Woodward, the famous organic chemist. So both people, independent from each other, suggested that a completely new structural motive should be explained the properties of that compound. Fischer, for example, <coughs> showed that 
when this remarkable substance was dissolved in concentrated sulfuric acid, nothing happened. And after removing the sulfuric acid, the substance was <clears throat> re-isolated completely as it was before. Very, very unusual. So soon after, <clears throat> it was proven that the structural proposal which both Fisher and Wilkinson made were correct. And Jack Dunnitz and Leslie Orgel, at the end of the famous year 1952, explained that we should see the bonding situation such, such as all these six pi electrons of the two rings systems are involved in the bonding. And it was these two people, Dunitz and Orgel, which suggested the name sandwich for this remarkable substance. That, at the end of that year, there started the fantastic development of the chemistry of sandwich compounds and it also started the race between Fischer and Wilkinson in an unprecedented rate. In the next two years, both teams published, each team published about a dozen papers about new cyclopentadienyl, mainly dicyclopentadienyl, <clears throat> element compounds, and when I say element, it means not only transition metals, but also elements, <clears throat> for example, <clears throat> like germanium, silicium, <clears throat> antimony, arsenic, they had also been prepared in this short period of time. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the sandwich complexes, <clears throat> the original ones with two cyclopentadienyl rings, very soon with two benzene rings, dibenzene chromium was the first bisarine compound prepared by Fischer and co-workers, but this was like a bang since then the development continued <clears throat> so that in less than three decades, all possible combinations. In the first row, you see two four-membered, five, six, seven, eight-membered rings with different central <coughs> um, metals. And in the second row, there are combinations of cyclopentadienyl with three, four, six, seven, and eight members ring. And that was, at least I can remember, and it is probably difficult for the young people, for the students right now, <coughs> how popular the chemistry of sandwich complexes in those days were. It finished at 1973 when Fisher and Wilkinson was awarded with the Nobel Prize. For some people that was quite strange since in the former decisions made by the Nobel Committee, if in those other decisions, mainly the first people who prepared a new type of compounds had been honored. But neither Porson nor Miller 
had continued to <coughs> investigate the chemistry of the sandwich complexes. And so it was Fisher and Wilkinson who received the Nobel Prize. And the Nobel Committee said a very essential part of a scientific discipline is its structure and its intellectual capacity. With their work, Fisher and Wilkinson have expanded the basic concept of chemistry and in this way have changed the structure of this discipline. The prize is an award for chemistry for chemists. And I'm certainly not the only one who would say that is a very, very good definition. <clears throat> but the dicyclopentadienyl iron, the so-called ferrocene, became also a playground for organic chemists. Since Woodward discovered that ferrocene is going very smoothly, electrophilic substitution, Woodward suggested that the attack of the electrophile goes primarily to the metal and then the electrophile migrates to one of the rings and finally by proton <coughs> dissoci dissociation <coughs> the final substituted compound is formed. This intermediate which Woodward attempted to isolate with the cyclopentadienyl ring and the cyclopentadiene ring system. This is a 16 electron species. It means in contrast to the ferrocene and the substituted ferrocene, it is two electron less than the maximum number of bonding electrons. So that was the idea that we attempted to, instead of using nickelo, uh, ferrocene, nickelocene, and treated nickelocene with the same type of electrophiles which also Woodward used. And one was the triphenylmethyl chloride. We could observe that there is the intermediate which we hoped to isolate, but we were not successful since the cleavage of the bond between nickel and this diene derivative occurred very rapidly. And so finally only, uh, <coughs> finally only nickel dichloride and the substituted cyclopentadiene were isolated. The next idea was, instead of chloride as a small anionic partner, we should use a more larger, a bigger anion, also an anion which has no tendency to bind to the metal. And so when we use, instead of the chloride, the tetrafluoborate, a real salt-like compound, or we use BF3 or nickel tet uh, bis tetrafluoboride, we obtain the first triple decker in almost quantitative yields. It is a dark red stable compound. <coughs> it dissolves in organic solvents like dichloromethane or tetrahydrofurane without decomposition. And I was also lucky at that time to have a British postdoc. He was very active and not only in chemistry because about only a few weeks after he arrived at Zurich, he founded the first 
rugby club at the University of Zurich. But at the same time, what was more important for us, he had experience in working with liquid HF, hydrogen fluoride. And he discovered that at the ETH, we were at the University of Zurich, but our neighbor, the ETH, they had for doing NMR experiments, so-called spaghetti tubes. That means tubes which are made of polytetrafluoroethylene. And they had already used these spaghetti tubes for NMR measurements. And so Trevor Court, this is charm, convinced the ETH colleagues that he should be used the spaghetti tubes with our compound or with our starting material and then he could prove by NMR that at first the originally desired cyclopentadienyl nickel cyclopentadiene is formed which loses cyclopentadiene to give this monomeric cyclopentadiene nickel cation with fluoride as anine, and Trevor was even uh, <coughs> <coughs> Trevor was even lucky that he could isolate that compound, which is not very stable, but which could prove by molecular weights and by elemental analysis that it has this monomeric structure. And this compound, as we expected, reacted immediately in seconds with nicalosine to give the triple decker. Antimony pentafluoride was a very good trapping reagent to give the corresponding uh, antimony hexafluoride anion and the stable salt. However, we were disappointed that this intermediate, this monomeric cyclopentadienyl nickel cation was absolutely unreactive toward ferrocene. And all attempts which we made remained unsuccessful. Many people asked us on those days, why didn't you use dicyclopentadienyl palladium and dicyclopentadienyl platinum, the same compounds with the same compounds in structure as supposed as nicalosine. But we learned very soon that not only our attempts were unsuccessful, but also the attempts of other groups who tried to obtain the dicyclopentadienyl palladium or platinum complexes failed. In those days, we were also interested in a similar class of cyclopentadienyl complexes, namely having instead of a second cyclopentadienyl ring, an allyl group pi bonded via the three carbon atoms to the metal. And these species had this uh, stable 18 configuration uh, which we have found in many other cases as the best choice for stability of complexes of that type. So uh, we tried to uh, <coughs> react these cyclopentadienyl allyl complexes with uh, phosphines or phosphides a very rapid reaction occurred, but gives only the nickel zero complexes having four phosphines or phosphides coordinated to the metal. The question was, what are the possible intermediates? In the case of nickel, we failed. But when we use the corresponding palladium or platinum compounds, <coughs> with an excess of the ligand, the same type of product, metal with four phosphines or phosphides, we have formed. 
<coughs> but by careful NMR experiments, we also observed that there is another type of product also involved, which by using an excess of the ligands, we were unable to isolate this dinuclear compound. And there's, in those days, also complexes of palladium or platinum with two phosphines or phosphides were unknown. And we found that if we use very bulky ligands, tricyclohexyl phosphine, tris-isopropyl phosphine, those very bulky ligands, then we could isolate these 14 electron species and they react as expected in a one-to-one -one reaction to give these dinuclear complexes in which the met ligand, metal, metal ligand is in a linear row and is um, <coughs> coordinated, as it is shown here above, with the five-membered ring and beneath with the allyl group. And it is possible, since we had isolated the palladium and platinum bisphosphine compounds, we could also prepare the mixed palladium platinum complexes. <coughs> That is shown here in this slide. Uh, it was also possible to displace the allyl group, for example, with halides, with thiol thiols, or with uh, acetate. And <coughs> the properties of these compounds we are regarding uh, to <coughs> further um, ligands are about the same. But we were unable, for example, to react the chloride or bromide on the left-hand side or the acetate on the right-hand side with sodium cyclopentadienyl to obtain a dinuclear complex having one planar ligand above and one planar ligand beneath this metal-metal bond. It was possible when we changed the <coughs> synthetic root, we started with the dinuclear palladium complex having two bridging acetate groups with sodium cyclopentadienyl, the <coughs> acetate, oh, so, so, sorry, the chloride was displaced by cyclopentadienyl. This compound with uh, the <coughs> sodium calcium um, <coughs> reduction material gave the wanted compound, but the better route was to displace the acetate ligand with a second cyclopentadienyl, and this at room temperature could be isolated and increasing the temperature led to this two bis palladium complex having two bridging cyclopentadienyl ligands. <clears throat> we could also investigate the fluxional behavior of this compound on the right side, the two rings, the pi bonded and the sigma bonded, exchange at particular conditions. And so this can be followed by doing NMR measurements at different temperatures. We also reacted the bispalladium compounds with um, other ligands than phosphine or phosphides. And then you see, as you see here, we obtained dinuclear palladium compounds having <coughs> isocyanide, SO2, or CO in the bridging positions. And 
this cyclopentadimia ring bonded only to one of the two palladium atoms. The inter most interesting displacement <coughs> reaction was that we, when we use the uh, ligand having the anion of uh, tertiary, tertiary butyl acetic acid, <clears throat> if we displaced this uh, bridging ligand by cobalt tetracarbonyl anion or cyclopentadienyl chromium molybdenum and tungsten tricarbonyl anions, in the cases of cobalt, we obtained a, tri a heteronuclear, trinuclear uh, compound and with the chromium molybdenum and tungsten anions, we obtained uh, <coughs> a tetra, a, a trine metal, mixed metal complex in which the key atoms, the two palladiums, the chromium molybdenum tungsten, and one carbon atom of CO form a tetrahedron <coughs> arrangement. What about the reactivity? I talked to you about the reactivity of the cyclopentadienyl allyl complexes, but what about the reactivity of the original sandwich compounds? Ferrocene is absolutely <coughs> unreactive towards all phosphines, phosphides, isocyanides, and so on, which we try. Nickel, nickelocene gives a mixture of products, and it was very difficult to separate these compounds. And so only with cobalt there was a clean reaction. <coughs> cobalt cobaltocene is a 19 electron compound, so it is much more reactive than ferrocene, and so under <clears throat> mild conditions, one of the cyclopentadienyl ring was displaced by two phosphine ligands to form the half sandwich with two coordinated uh, phosphines. It was also possible to prepare the corresponding rhodium compound, and it turned out that these complexes of the type this is shown on the top of this scheme, these complex are strong bases, Lewis bases, or as we call it, metal bases. Even with the weak acid ammonium cation, a protonation at the metal occurred with alkyl iodides, alkylation occurs with acyl chloride acylation with uh, trimethylsilyl or, uh, <coughs> uh, or staniel chloride. A product is formed having a rhodium, cobalt or rhodium and uh, germanium and tin bond and also a corresponding oxidation with chlorine or iodine forms the compound on the left-hand side of this slide. And it was not only the bisphosphine complexes which we used in those reactions at the starting material, but also relatives of these compounds, of the bisphosphine compounds, relatives which are shown in this slide, are able to undergo oxidative addition reactions with acids, methyl iodide, dichloromethane, <coughs> or chloroform. The synthesis of the alkyne complex in this slide, it is shown that methyl or phenyl groups are bonded to the alkyne, but when they use the most simple alkyne, acetylene, then not the alkyne compound 
on the above right hand side was formed, but instead the isomer corresponding if R would be H in the above compound, the isomer, the ligand called vinylidine, is the only compound which is isolated by reacting the acetylene square planar acetylene complex with sodium cyclopentadienyl. And when we use now the mixed alkyne, one bigger part, one bigger um, substituent like phenyl and the other hydrogen, then if, it is react, if the reaction is done very immediately after the starting material has been isolated with sodium cyclopentadienyl, then the expected alkyne rhodium complex is formed. But if we take the starting material in solution, we can observe an equilibrium with the isomeric hydridoalkyneal rhodium complex, an isomer of the starting material, and this intermediate reacts with sodium cyclo with this uh, um, ex uh, <coughs> isomerizes to the uh, corresponding vanillidine compound, having now only one hydrogen and the phenyl group coordinated to the beta carbon atom. Both the alkyne and the isomeric <coughs> phenyl vanillidine compound react with sodium cyclopentadienyl. On the left hand side, the alkyne complex is formed on the right-hand side, the vanillidine compound. But it is not possible if the uh, coordination is, or the electron configuration is uh, like an 18 electron species on the left-hand side, this alkyne complex does not isomerize to <coughs> obtain the vanillidine isomer. In the course of these investigations, we <coughs> prepared not only vinylidine, rhodium, or iridium complexes, but also the so-called, this is our slang in the lab, the MC3, the MC4, and the MC5 compounds. With rhodium and with iridium, only the, MC, the MC4 complex was isolated with iridium. And we have investigated, in particular, the reactivity of complexes of that type. <coughs> we showed, as seen in this diagram, the alanilidine rhodium complex having the linear rhodium CCC linkage. When we use this as a starting material, we were able to prepare two isomeric <coughs> butatriene rhodium complexes. In one isomer, the alpha-beta carbon atoms are coordinated and in the second isomer, the beta-gamma carbon atoms are. But both isomers react with carbon monoxide by displacing the butatriene and form these um, uncoordinated butatrienes of which those with the hydrogen at one end of the C4 arrangement we are unknown. But of course this is not a preparative method of synthesis, but we, we are just uh, happy to show that it is possible in general to prepare butatrienes on this very noble uh, type of reaction. I had a very excellent student from the University of Murcia Juan Gil Rubio, 
He was the king late in our group who investigated the reactivity of rhodium alanilidine complexes. And as you see, he was, for example, able to couple two of the rhodium alanilidine fragments with the dianion of the uh, tetracarbon dialkyne in question. So uh, if this complex shown above on the slide reacts with carbon monoxide at room temperature, there is an addition of the carbon monoxide to the rhodium and the uh, alanilidine ligand present in the starting material is now <coughs> coordinating in a separate way to the rhodium. There are still the uh, C4 carbon atoms, which are now bonded in contrast to the starting material, also to the alpha carbon of the alanilidine. Increasing the temperature led to a further rearrangement and so we have another C10 unit as bridging ligand between the two rhodiums. And it is almost a linear C8 unit which spans the space between the two metals. Finally, after having investigated and synthesized Rhodium complexes with vinylidine and the three, four, and five carbon <coughs> ligands. There was the quest for obtaining the most simple rhodium compa compounds having a rhodium carbon double bond, namely rhodium carbenes. As you see, with simple alkynes, the vinylidine compounds are formed, and with propargylic alcohols, which are easily available, the alanilidine compound are the product. But what could be used to obtain the carbene? The first experiments failed. If we used either diazomethane or the corresponding diphenyl diazomethane, we only observed in the first case the formation of an ethene, ethylene rhodium compound by coupling of two CH2 units, and second, the complete uh, <coughs> reagent diphenyl carbon diazomethane coordinates to rhodium. We have also a crystal structure of the compound and there is, as expected, a linear rhodium, nitrogen, nitrogen, carbon uh, <coughs> linkage. So no carbene was observed in these experiments. But the key to success came when we changed the ligand. When we use instead of triisopropyl phosphine, for example, triisopropyl stibine, then with the corresponding uh, diazoalkane <coughs> having <coughs> R and R prime as H, <coughs> the ethene complex, as in the other slide, is obtained. But if we use instead of the diazomethane, the di-substituted uh, compound as starting material, now there was no reaction, no reaction at all if triisopropyl phosphine are the ligands. But if we use the, <coughs> I'm sorry that there's a mistake in the slide since on the left-hand side above, there should not be uh, SB um, isopropyl 
uh, stibine but isopropyl phosphine. So, uh, but if we use the starting material, the ethene complex, and react this with the uh, disubstituted diazoalkane, the corresponding carbene rhodium compound is obtained. It reacts with the sodium cyclopentadienyl to give the half sandwich rhodium carbene. With the square planar compound in brackets, there is an exchange of the stibine by the phosphine possible. Then we obtain the bisphosphine carbene, which had not been which has not been <coughs> obtained via the ethene rhodium compound as starting material, but now the square planar rhodium carbene with the two phosphine ligands re also reacts like the stibine analog to give a rhodium uh, carbene. And these rhodium carbenes <coughs> are quite reactive with CO, the stibine ligand is displaced to give the carbonyl carbene complex. This reacts with sulfur or selenium to form a thio or selenium ketone as, pi, as um, coordinated via the carbon and the sulfur or selenium. And the starting material with CO and carbene reacts with copper chloride and sodium cyclopentadienyl to give a mixed metal bis-cyclopentadienyl rhodium copper compound. But Peter Schwab, Rinaldo mentioned that uh, <coughs> he did some work in our group also to obtain the Rupp's uh, carbene with ruthenium as central metal, which is an excellent <coughs> reagent for olefin metathesis. He prepared this Grubbs carbene when he was a postdoc in Grubbs group. But before, in his PhD thesis, he attempted to opt to <coughs> to determine the melting point of these uh, starting material on the left-hand side. And he observed very careful what happened by constant heating of this small tube, which are used for the determination of melting points. And then he observed that just before it started to melt, there was a change in color. And so he stopped later in a <clears throat> higher quantity of the starting material, heated very slowly the compound, and then he observed that a new type of dinuclear rhodium compounds or a new type of dinuclear <clears throat> transition metal compounds are formed in which the stibine ligand is in a completely uh, equal and uh, in a bridging position with equal distances to the two rhodiums. And this is the type of Chacal drawings which <clears throat> Norbert Marr uh, uh, determined in our group. So, uh, we, of course, tried immediately to displace the bridging stibine ligand by a phosphine ligand. That seemed to us the highest challenge, to have the phosphine ligand type, which is so often used in coordination and also in organometallic chemistry, but we failed to displace in these compounds the stibine by the phosphine. So we had to go a way around. We first have to displace the chloride ligands by acetyl acetonate. 
We can do it stepwise depending on the amount of the sodium acetyl acetate which we use. So we could obtain a compound <coughs> uh, first in which only one chloride was displaced by the acetyl acetonate. <coughs> now in this product, the distances between the antimone and the two rhodiums are different. They differ by about 0.4 of an angstrom. But with an excess of the sodium acetyl acetonate, also the second chloride could be displaced and be obtained the complex seen on the right-hand side above. <coughs> so why or how can the, what we wanted already having the phosphine in the bridging position. It is possible on two different routes. The better one is to use the monochloro monoacetyl acetonate complex as the starting material. In this starting material, the stibine is cleanly displaced by the trimethyl phosphine, and this reacts with the second molecule of sodium acetyl acetonate to give the final product in which the trimethylphosphine is in a clean bridging position. Distances to the two rhodiums are almost identical. <coughs> with the trimethylphosphine in the bridge with the two acetyl acetonate as the uh, <coughs> as the ligands, the uh, <coughs> chelate ligands, they can be displaced, these acetyl acetonates, by chloride. And as you see, when we isolated the compound, we did not obtain the complex seen on the right-hand side but we isolate it, and that depends on the solvent and the temperature which we used for obtaining single crystals. We obtained a rhodium-2, rhodium-2 dimer, a dimer in which the two rhodium-2 parts are bridged by two chlorides. And only in dilute solutions we can observe that there is an equilibrium of this dimer with the corresponding monomer. By <coughs> also using instead of trimethylphosphine, triphenyl or triisopropylphosphine, we thought that with the two acetyl acetonate ligands, it should be possible to <coughs> give a clean displacement of the stibine by the phosphine. But what occurred is, and seen on the left-hand side, on the down row, <coughs> that there is a rearrangement of one of the ac ac ligands to the neighbor rhodium atoms. And the phosphine is not coordinated in the bridge, but as the <coughs> terminal ligand. But when we then treated this compound with HCl in organic solvent, we were really happy to have now also dinucleorodium complexes in which not only trimethyl but also triisopropyl or triphenylphosphine, larger phosphines are in the bridging positions. And so finally, it was also possible to <coughs> fill the distance between phosphor and antimone in between is arsenic. And using again the dirhodium complex with the 
terminal and act ligands. The stibine can, could be displaced by trimethyl arsine that it depends on the concentration. If we use it in the ratio of one to one, one out starting material and one uh, equivalent of trimethyl arsine, there is no complete reaction. But by using an excess of the arsine, the arsine bridge compound on the right hand side is formed. And this arsine bridge complex, as well as the stibine complex with the two ac, -ac ligands, we have already seen that the stibine could be displaced by the phosphine, and also the arsine can be displaced very cleanly. So the thermodynamic stability is as one would expect that phosphines form the strongest bridge between the two metals. And with the arsine in the bridge, again, depending on the conditions, uh, <clears throat> it was possible also here to isolate a rhodium-2, rhodium-2 dimer with the two arsines still in the bridging position. <clears throat> As you realized, uh, I am no more a young person. <clears throat> and the last time that I gave a lecture <clears throat> about science or about chemistry that was in 2011 when we celebrated at Bordeaux the 60th birthday of Didier Astruc, a friend of mine for <clears throat> many years. But between 2011 and today, I never talked about chemistry, at least not in the public. I was interested in summarizing some historical events since I observed during my academic career that it became more and more difficult if you give lectures to first or third or five-year students and to explain where the present knowledge comes from. So I decided first to write a book about the parts of organometallic chemistry which we were interested in and also other colleagues worldwide were interesting in and second I wrote at least and that was a little bit more easy because it was in German I wrote a fairly thick book about the history of inorganic chemistry in general starting with the 17th century so I was nevertheless without a lab, fairly busy. But, and I think this was one of the privilege which I had after I became Professor Emeritus, I had more time, maybe not enough for the family. And of course, I would like to think in particular not, in particular, not the institutions which gave me the money to do the work which we have done. But I already said that I had excellent students and postdocs, and more importantly, I had a very, very and a, a, a family which understood that I could not be from one day to the other 
a private person. So nevertheless, the family life in the last uh, 20 years became more and more important. And apart from my wife and my children, there were in particular these three little guys which helped me to explore, as it is mentioned in the song, the bright right of the life. Thank you. Difficulty to find the proper words. This this was fantastic. Uh, I think, uh, given the context of this lecture, uh, I consulted also with the chairman. There should not be any discussion. Um, but uh, before I hand the floor for the uh, closing uh, ceremony, please perhaps let me just make a couple of uh, comments. I hope that will be appropriate. Uh, um, maybe just reiterating the words that Professor Werner said at the end, I was prepared to say pretty much the same thing myself. I find that this lecture was particularly interesting, I believe, for the students, because um, we give so many things for granted nowadays. We learn things, the students nowadays learn a lot of these things in the books and give them for granted. But in those days, uh, there were uh, active fields of research, just like uh, what we're doing now is an active field of research giving rise to controversies and the debates and so on. And uh, Professor Werner, I think, was very uh, good at uh, giving you a feeling of how these days were and uh, how ideas were uh, progressing and shaped our discipline to the point in which it is today. That's the first thing I wanted to mention. And then uh, the other thing is really that uh, I think this was a very small selection. Of course, Professor Werner didn't have time to show all of the contributions that he has given. But uh, I think it was an appropriate selection to uh, demonstrate to, to you uh, the impact that his own work has, has made in the field and uh, how highly he deserved to have this award. So I would like you to join me, please, in thanking Professor Werner again to recognize his prize. So now the floor is back to the conference chairman for the concluding uh, remarks and the prizes and, and uh, some it thanks maybe. Also the poster prizes, they will be also now. So please uh, remain for the closing remarks because in two minutes we will be just uh, starting the closing remarks and the, and the poster prizes, okay? Remain, remain. <laughs>
Okay, so thank you very much for staying until the very end. We are a little bit uh, running a little bit late, so thank you, especially to, to stay for the last uh, uh, part of the conference, the closing remarks, where the, the a very, very important part of the conference happens, which is when we uh, reveal which ones are the winners of the posters awards. The, we have been uh, sponsored by Dalton Transactions, by the UCR, by the GECO, the Spanish uh, Organometallic Group, and also by uh, Helvetica Chimica Acta and by Eurogeek. So we are going to, to say now who... Uh, uh, <laughs> wow. Oh, it's it's impressive. Coming up. Yes. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> this is high tech. High tech. Perhaps <laughs> not. Sorry. Ah, you pass. Ah, okay. Okay. So, so then the then so we will start by saying the the winners of the uh, the Spanish Society, uh, or the special group of the Spanish Society, uh, the GECO. Sorry, ah, no, for that, oh, sorry, sorry, for that don't Sorry, 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 by that, sorry. So there will be two awards for the Dalton transactions. The first one is for uh, Lisa Grabor for her poster uh, name, a phenolate carbon supported high valent Iron oxygen intermediate derived from dioxygen. I don't know if she's in the audience. She's in the audience. Uh, maybe, maybe she's not in the audience. I don't know if anyone. Is anyone from the team that can get the. Sorry? Ah, okay, okay, so if you can come, yes, please come, yes, please come. Also, the award uh, uh, has also some economic uh, parts, so we also will send it to her. So we will contact her. So if you can also send it. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second Dalton transaction. Uh, how do you? Uh, do you? Oh, he, he's doing it. Okay, okay. The second award of the Dalton transaction is for David Sanchez Roa for her post, his poster. NC, NHC, CDI, beta ions as ligands towards group 13 elements, coordination studies and reactivity. the next poster Echo. prizes, which is the specialized group of organometallic chemistry, HECO. And uh, the first prize goes to uh, Joseph M. Parr. Oh, no. Ah, to Samuel, oh, sorry. They're they have, not in the right order. They're not in the right order, sorry, sorry. For Samuel Toro, <laughs> for his... <laughs> And uh, I guess that I have revealed the name of the other poster <laughs> award <laughs> for it's not. <laughs> so the, the, the so-called poster award from the GECO is for Joseph M. Parr for his poster, Metal for Mill Complexes as Intermediate in Carbon Carbon Bond Formation.
Uh, I would like to say that uh, it will be good to have a good picture of, of all the, the, the awardees. So when, I, when we finish uh, giving away the names, please come back to the stage to have a picture with all of you as a group. So the next uh, award is the one funded by Helvetica, uh, Química Acta, and uh, it goes to Andreu Tortajada for his uh, presentation, Tailoring Sodium Organometallic Reagents for RN Functionalization. Neil, come please. And uh, now uh, the, the UCR uh, Journal Sport Poster Prize uh, goes to uh, Robin Sievers for his presentation introducing the perfluorinated CP star ligand into coordination chemistry. And uh, finally, the, uh, the, the poster prize that is supported by Eurogig, it goes to Anika Schulz for his, her presentation, T-shaped TMO complexes with cationic threadlines, observation of LZ ligand duality and their use in hydrogenation catalysis. So, so please, if all the awardees can come to the stage for a group photo, please. And, and also I would like to say that uh, uh, this award has an economic uh, part that uh, we will just uh, contact all of you by mail to, to make it effective. So now uh, I would like uh, just to say very, very few, few words. I think uh, we have really overrun uh, the, the time now. But uh, I would like uh, to say that uh, it has been a great uh, pleasure to host uh, the conference here, where uh, I think that uh, cutting edge of organometallic, uh, uh, organometallic chemistry has been presented. And I would like uh, to thank uh, all the speakers for their outstanding presentation. And uh, also everybody with, that uh, have given a presentation, all the oral and poster presentations that have been great. We have seen amazing chemistry from in all the different groups of the periodic table. It has been remarkable the amount of uh, presentations coming from main group, and, uh, but uh, it has been a lot of uh, new chemistry from uh, metals that maybe hadn't been looked at so often, so it has been great to see all this new uh, uh, expansion of uh, this chemistry. And, uh, and I would like uh, uh, to thank again my team, the, the rest of the organizing committee, which uh, has been like, uh, extremely helpful. Uh, I would like uh, also to thank the technical secretariat and of course of all our team of uh, volunteers that uh, it has been a fan they have been doing a fantastic, fantastic work. So I would like uh, to ask for an applause to all of them.
and especially I would like uh, to thank all of you, all the uh, participants, because I think uh, what makes the conference is the participants, and I would like to thank you for all your engagement, engagement and enthusiasm. I think like uh, all the sessions were really lively, and I hope that uh, that has created the atmosphere for a very a lot of networking and starting new collaborations. And uh, definitely, I, I would like to thank you very much uh, for being here and also for your really eager participation in all the different uh, sessions of this conference. So also I would like uh, to thank to you all. And I pass the word to Rinaldo Poli as a representative of the organ metallic section of the UKEM. Yes, okay, so this is a little heavy duty for me because I wasn't supposed to be on this podium for the closing ceremony. This was the job of uh, Martin Albrecht, who uh, in fact gave uh, the opening uh, speech uh, on behalf of the Division of Organometallic Chemistry. Uh, but he had to catch an early flight. In fact, uh, uh, I apologize for him. Uh, he asked me to do so. And uh, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, there, is, there is a board. The division um, uh, has meetings every year, like we had one here, and I'm on the board. There are four persons on the board, president, who's a Martin, vice president, who's Beatrice Royo, and who also had to leave to go to another conference. And then there is Montserrat Dieguez as treasurer, and myself, I am the web editor. And, but I'm stepping down, this, this is my last year, and so I was asked to replace uh, Martin. So um, a couple of things maybe I would like to say. First of all, because maybe it's not all of you know, but especially the young students, but uh, uh, we're really proud because this uh, series of conferences, uh, which is under the auspices of a division of UCHEMS, this is the Division of Organometallic Chemistry, uh, it, it may not be the oldest division, but this is the oldest running a series of conferences of the divisions of, uh, of the UCAMS. Because this, as uh, Janusz Lewinsky reminded in his lecture, um, was in fact started by uh, Stanislav Pazinkiewicz. This is the 25th edition, so which means 50 years. Um, so uh, it's the oldest running uh, series of conferences. I think what the uh, various uh, speakers and poster presenters have demonstrated very clearly is that this is still, since the days of uh, Wilkinson and Fisher, as Professor Werner has reminded us today, since those days, our discipline remains a very uh, active, very vibrant uh, discipline, rich of uh, results, rich of implication and applications. We have seen many, many applications in this conference, whether it's in catalysis, whether it's in materials, whether it's in uh, uh, bio, biology on, on medicine, and, and, uh, and, and for this reason, I think that this uh, discipline uh, still has a very, very bright future. Um, so um, with that, I, I cannot stop without uh, adding to, um, first of all, I would like to echo, of course, the um, appreciation that uh, Marta uh, gave to the organizers and the volunteers and perhaps we, we should have a second hand of applause to the volunteers of this conference and the organizing committee. And, and Marta said that the success of this conference is due to the, to the presence of, of, of you guys who came here for this conference. But nothing would happen without the effort of the chairperson. So I really please join me in thanking warmly Marta Mosquera for her effort. <laughs> and so with that, I, I'll give the floor back to Marta for the closing words, I think. Okay. Uh... I think uh, now this is time, Every, all, all the good things have uh, to have an end, so I think that this is time probably now to, to, to close uh, this conference. I hope that you have enjoyed these days and you have enjoyed the town also. 
And uh, the only thing is remain to say is like, uh, we see you in two years time in Bern. And uh, I pass the, <laughs> the, 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 the responsibility, the button, <laughs> sorry, I pass the button to Eva that she will be uh, the one organizing it in Bern in two years time. Yeah, thank you very much. See you all in Bern. Have a safe journey home. And remember, 6 to the 11th of July, 2025. Bye.